The defendant, Eric Menendez, is in court with his attorneys. The people are represented, and the Eric Menendez jury is in the courtroom. Good morning to you all. Good morning. And we're ready to resume with the trial. The people will call their next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The people call Al Jerome Ozeal. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Ozeal, what is your occupation? I'm a psychologist. In the early fall of 1988, did you begin seeing Eric and Lyle Menendez relating to incidents which occurred in Calabasas in which the defendants were involved? Yes, I did. Drawing your attention to the date of October 31st, 1989, did you see Eric Menendez on the afternoon, approximately 4.15 on that day? Yes, I did. Had the defendant, Eric Menendez, gotten in touch with you shortly before that? That's correct. Do you recall about when he got in touch with you? I believe it was either one day or two days ahead of time. Okay. Did he set up uh, a session with you? Yes, he did. Okay. On that particular day, uh, would you describe what occurred as Eric Menendez arrived at your office? Yes, and uh, may I ask the court if, uh, if I can refer to notes during this or whether I should? Yes, if you have notes and you feel they'll help you in some way in your testimony, you may refer to them. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ozeal, did you prepare notes shortly after this session, October yes, 31st? Yes, I did. These are, these are the notes. Um, Eric came in and he was, uh, he was extremely agitated and extremely uh, depressed and he began um, talking with me about the fact that his parents had been murdered and that he felt very isolated and very alienated and he'd lost a lot of weight. Uh, he had had some suicidal ideation and um, he just began disclosing a lot of things that had to do with uh, feeling depressed and feeling lost. Did he talk about having dreams? Yes, he talked about having, uh, having some nightmares that were very vivid images of his parents being dead and, and having um, images of the, the scene of uh, having uh, seen them dead. At some point, did he ask to leave your office? Yes, he did. Uh, would you describe that for the jurors? Yes. Um, Eric had told me that he wanted to uh, take a walk um, I wasn't sure exactly what the reason was, but he said he wanted to take a walk and uh, tell me something that was, um, they didn't want to tell me inside the office. Excuse me, Honor, is there any particular reason why the witness is facing away from I, I asked the witness to describe uh, All right. what he, happened. He asked me to, to tell the jurors, and I thought that meant to That's fine. You may tell the jurors. face uh, whichever way you want. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he after telling me a lot of uh, detail about uh, his depression and his, uh, his feelings of despair, uh, at some point in the session, he asked me to take a walk with him um, and to leave the actual uh, physical office that we were in. So we did take a walk. Um, we walked outside the office and uh, to a, a small restaurant called the Bagel Mosh and um, just used the restroom facilities there and then took a walk uh, from the Bagel Nosh to uh, a strip of land that is park-like uh, in Beverly Hills. He sat on a bench and for um, a significant period of time, uh, Eric told me uh, things about his father and, and how his father was a, a great man and how he intended to, to um, write a book about his father and that uh, it was amazing that uh, his father wouldn't be able to fulfill, fulfill a lot of the um, a lot of the goals that he'd had, a lot of the ambitions, and maybe he could, uh, he could help do that in a book that he would write. And at some point in the session, as we were uh, sitting in the park, uh, uh, we just discussed going back to the office, and we headed back to the office, and uh, right before we entered the uh, front door of the office building in which I had my office, 
um, he uh, leaned back uh, against, uh, as I recall, a, a parking meter that was in front of the office door and, and said, um, we did it. Um, and I don't know if he said, I, we killed our parents, but I asked him, you, you mean you killed your parents? He said, yes. And uh, from that point, we went back up into the office. And your office is located in Beverly Hills? That's correct. Now, after he said that uh, we did it, did you ascertain from him who he was referring to besides himself? Uh, yes. And who was that, that other person? Lyle. Did you then go into your office? Yes, we did. And what happened there? Um, well, from that point on, uh, Eric began describing in pretty elaborate detail um, exactly uh, what happened. Um, he began to tell me all about how the murder took place and, and all the details of, of the murder. And what did he say in that regard? Um, well, he told me that it began with um, a, uh, the, the, the plan to uh, kill the parents actually began in a uh, situation where Eric was um, watching a BBC uh, television show or movie, I'm not sure which it was, that had to do with the theme of the person in the film uh, killing their father. And um, at some point in the uh, watching of it, um, Eric called Lyle in the room and shared with him what the content was of the, uh, of the movie. And um, as I recall, Eric said it, it, it began with sort of a casual conversation between the two of them. They, they started discussing uh, what would happen or how it would be if, if the person who was uh, a, a dominating force and a negative force and a, a very controlling person in their life um, wasn't there anymore. And um, at that point, it evolved into a, a discussion about um, killing uh, the parents, most particularly the father uh, first, and then the parents. Um, and that's, that's the way the actual discussion began. Did uh, Eric Menendez describe for you, um, in particular, what it was that he was upset with his father about? Uh, yes, he did. What did he say? Well, uh, basically that, um, that the father had just been completely uh, dominating and uh, controlling, was impossible to please, had, had uh, perfectionistic standards, um, that he was controlling of a lot of different aspects of, of Eric and Lyle's life in a very extreme way, and also that he had been very controlling and very damaging um, to their mother, and that she also was miserable. So basically, they they conceptualized the father. Or told me that they, Eric told me that they saw the father as someone who was pretty much um, n not possible to live with. That he was just um, an emotionally uh, dominating, tyrannical person. In describing uh, why Eric Menendez was upset with his father, he, you include you had stated that they had planned to kill the father, but also the mother. Did you ask uh, Eric Menendez why he included the mother in this plan? Uh, at this point, uh, I, I believe I did. And, and the reason that the mother was included in the plan was basically um, that they couldn't find a way not to include her in the plan. And they also began to see the mother as somebody um, who was very victimized by the, uh, by the father. Um, she had apparently been suicidal before, and uh, they couldn't find a way to accomplish the end of killing the father without also killing the mother. Um, the reason being that the mother would have been a witness, number one and would have reported them. Number two, they didn't believe that the mother could have survived emotionally anyway without the father. And three, they thought the mother was so miserable that it was, and this is not Eric, Eric's words, uh, sort of like a euthanasia um, situation. Your, I'd move to strike if it's not Eric's words. The, the euthanasia was not Eric's words. All right, why don't you pursue that, Mr. Priyama? The answer is, the answer to the word is strict. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Did Eric Menendez indicate to you? Your Honor, also at this point, um, I would object to move to strike the last answer because it does not appear to be responsive to the question about what was being said by Eric Menendez on October 31st in this early portion of the discussion. Right. The objection is overruled, but you'll have to, or either on direct or cross, clarify the matter. All right. Your next question. Thank you, Your Honor. Did Eric Menendez indicate to you, Doctor, that uh, he felt his mother was unhappy at that time? Yes, he did. Okay. Now, would you describe for the jurors uh, what steps in planning uh, the murders that Eric recounted to you in this session? Well, Your Honor, I'm going to object to leading in that method um, this witness based on the notes. I don't think that's an appropriate question. Objection or rule. Okay. Um, well, Eric relayed to me that at, at the point that uh, he and Lyle had discussed um, planning the murder, that um, Eric felt a need to commit the, the murder relatively quickly, or he basically thought that he would lose the emotional ability to, to commit the act. Um, Lyle. Um, according to Eric's recounting, uh, wanted to to take some time to plan it out more effectively to make sure that it was as perfect as could be, um, and Eric just didn't feel that he could do that. So they they had agreed that they would commit the murder, and they were they were negotiating uh, how soon to do it. Um, after that point, what they did, and I believe, uh, the best of my recollection, it was something like uh, um, a a week or so. Uh, before the murder. Wait, um, wait, hold it right there, Dr. Roziel. Mm -hmm. it, this discussion about planning the murder occurred one week before the actual murder? Is That's that the best saying? of my recollection. Okay. Approximately one week. Something like that. Okay. Um, what they did at that point, I mean, I, it, it could, I should clarify, it could have been a well, week. Your Honor, I'm going to object to this point. The preceding part of the answer was not responsive, but. I'll the ask witness another is question. being asked what was done by way of planning. All right. Uh, the objection is overruled. The answer will stand. But if you can clarify this, uh, Mr. Kuriyama. Thank you, Your Honor. This discussion that Eric Menendez related to you that he was having with his brother Lyle about planning the murders of their parents, is it your understanding that that discussion uh, by what Eric Menendez told you occurred about a week before the actual killings? It's my understanding that it, it occurred uh, at least a week before, based upon my recollection. Um, at that point, what they did, uh, according to Eric, was drive to San Diego, uh, obtain some false identification, um, purchase two shotguns with the false identification, uh, drive back to Los Angeles um, and then create or have an alibi in the form of a wine and cheese tasting party. Um, and then shortly before the, the party began, Eric recounted to me that they uh, surprised their parents in the room in which their parents were, uh, were found murdered. And um, according to Eric's recounting, as I recall it, uh, that, that um, Excuse me, Anna, but I think that the question was, what was the planning? Right. The objection is sustained. Uh, at this point, you can ask another question. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Ozeal, did Eric Menendez use the term surprised when he was referring to what they did when they walked into the room? They surprised their parents? I, I recall that he did. Did he, Eric Menendez, describe for you what took place at the crime scene, what they did with the shotguns? Uh, yes. Um, as I recall, Eric said that, um, that he entered the room first, and I believe that he was uh, shooting at his uh, father, um, and then Lyle um, followed after him and um, basically, quote, Lyle finished off the job. Uh, um, it's not clear to me entirely who was primarily responsible for shooting the mother and who's primarily responsible for shooting the father. Based on what Eric Menendez told you, uh, was it your impression that both brothers shot 
at their parents? Well, let me uh, ask a point of clarification here. Excuse um, me, Your Honor, but we would object. I think the question can be answered yes or no. Uh, well, do you understand the question? Or do you need some clarification? I think I need some clarification. All right. And um, why don't you ask another question and see if you can do it that way, Mr. Kuriyama. Is it your impression, Dr. Ozeal, that both brothers fired their shotguns? Yes. This, is a, this is a question asked of Dr. Ozeal regarding what Eric Menendez told yeah. him at this time. Correct. Okay. Y yes, it is. Did Eric Menendez uh, tell you what occurred at the crime scene as they were shooting their parents? Yes, he did. What did he say? Um, Eric told me that uh, his father uh, said something like, no, no, and, and, and uh, turned, turned away and was shot as he was saying that. And uh, the mother was, I think, shot second and I, I guess began to stand or something of that nature and, and was shot and then fell to the ground. Um, and he relayed to me that the father, um, I, as I recall, it died first and the mother did not uh, die with the first um, shots that were fired at her and that um, what happened at that point is that uh, both Eric and uh, Lyle went outside to get some more cartridges and uh, reloaded the, uh, the shotguns and, um, and went in and Lyle, I believe, um, finished murdering uh, their mother. Did Eric Menendez uh, describe for you what his mother was doing on the floor that necessitated them having to reload the shotguns? Yes, he did. What did he say to you? Uh, he said that she was moaning and uh, trying to crawl. Did he indicate to you that after they returned, after loading or reloading their shotguns, that one brother in particular uh, shot the mother? I'm going to object to the form of the question in particular. All right, uh, rephrase the question, please. Dr. Ozeal, did Eric Menendez tell you uh, who it was that uh, finally killed the mother? Best of my recollection, it was uh, that Lyle did. Did Eric Menendez tell you what happened after both parents were then dead, what they did at the crime scene? Um, yes. What did he say? At the crime scene or? What did he say that he did along with his brother at the crime scene? Um, what they did is go back into their car and, um, uh, and try to pick up all of the casings or, or shotgun shells that, that might have been around and um, and then take their uh, uh, change of clothes, I guess, with them. And um, and then are you asking me what happened? Uh, uh, let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Did Eric Menendez describe for you the scene of the room in which uh, he and his brother had killed their parents? Yes, he did. How did he describe that scene to you? That there was um, blood. Uh, all over the room and pieces of tissue uh, all over the room. Did he indicate to you that he had gotten blood on his clothing? Uh, yes, I, I believe he indicated that both um, brothers had gotten blood on their clothing. And did he tell you what he did with that clothing? Yes, he did. What did he say? Um, he said that they changed the clothing and uh, uh, put it into a bag and uh, dumped it into a dumpster. At the crime scene where the parents were killed, did he, did he indicate to you that he had picked up any evidence from that location? Yes, he did. What, what did he say? That he picked up uh, the casings or shotgun shells that uh, might have been left as evidence and uh, prepared to dispose of them. Did he describe for you where, that is, Eric Menendez went to dispose of uh, the bloody clothes that he had placed in the bag? Uh, just to a dumpster. I don't recall which dumpster it was or where. I don't think he told me. 
like one of those big green bins. He didn't describe it in that much detail. Did Eric Menendez tell you what he did with the shotguns that were used? Yes, he did. What did he say? Um, he said that he and Lyle drove to uh, Mulholland Drive and that um, I think it was Lyle stayed in the car and uh, acted sort of as a scout and Eric, um, or a lookout I should say, and that uh, Eric uh, took the uh, shotguns and brought them, best of my recollection, it was something like 250 feet uh, down the side of the hill off of Mulholland and placed them there. Uh, and as I recall, he, he didn't actually say that he buried them, but that he sort of, that they were uh, above ground and he sort of tried to cover them up a bit. They were, I think they were relatively exposed. Did, did he describe for you um, what he changed into from his bloodied clothes? Just into new clothing. Okay. And did he tell you what he did uh, after um, secreting the shotguns? What did he do next? Um, I, I think that they then went to the the uh, it, the party. I'm sort of losing the. Um, I think they went to the party afterwards. Did he tell you what happened after uh, after going to this uh, wine tasting party? Yes, he did. What did he do after that? Um, when you say, clarification, what did, what did he do? Are you asking me only about Eric or what he related to me about Lyle as well? At this point, I, I want to know what Eric told you. If it includes Lyle, you can testify Ex about that as well. Excuse me, Your Honor, before there's an answer, can I confer with counsel for me? Sure. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Ozeal, did uh, Eric Menendez tell you anything about having an alibi? for the killings? Your Honor, I'm going to object. Ask to approach. All right. Dr. Ozeal, after Eric indicated <coughs> to you that he went to this uh, wine tasting party in Santa Monica after disposing of the guns, did he indicate to you that he returned to his house? Yes, he did. And did he indicate to you that uh, uh, 911 was called? Yes, he did. Okay. Did he indicate to you that uh, the police did not initially link them to the crime? Yes, he did. And did he at that time tell you that they had an alibi uh, being the wine tasting party? That's correct. Did he also tell you that the police had uh, thought that the mafia or some business connections uh, had murdered his parents. That's correct. And that he and his brother were not primary suspects at that time. That's correct. Did he indicate to you in this session uh, that they were at that point being treated as the aggrieved sons? I don't know that he used those words, aggrieved sons. I mean, he he may have described something that uh, approximated that, but he didn't say aggrieved sons. Okay. Did he indicate to you on that date that he had, he was starting to have difficulty dealing with the fact that he would be inheriting $15 million or splitting that with his brother? Yes, he did. Did he tell you that his guilt was overwhelming and he had, he had to come in and tell you? That's correct. At that point in, in the session of the, of the 31st of October, did you ask Eric Menendez whether Lyle Menendez knew that what, what Eric was telling you? Yes, I did. And what information did you get from Eric Menendez on that? That Lyle uh, absolutely did not know that Eric was telling me and that um, Eric was frightened about uh, Lyle's reaction should he find out. Find out that uh, Eric had told somebody of what they had done? Had confessed the murders to me, yes. You may want to take a look at your notes on page six. Okay, I have them. 
Now, Do you want me to read them over? If you would. Okay. I've read them over. Dr. Oziel, did Eric Menendez indicate to you on October 31st, 1989, that there was no way to link him and his brother to the murders? Yes, he did. Okay, would you describe for the jurors what it is he actually said to you? To the best of my recollection, what he said is that um, there were fingerprints in the house, but there were their fingerprints and they lived in the house, so that wasn't a linkage. Uh, to the best of their knowledge, uh, no one heard anything. Um, so there were no witnesses who had heard any sounds or, or anything at the time that the murder was committed. Um, that there were no weapons that, um, that had been found and he didn't believe that there was any way to link <coughs> the weapons which had been hidden um, to them. And so basically, um, insofar as he knew, uh, it, was a, uh, it was a perfect murder. There was no way to link he or Lyle to having committed the murder except through my knowing about it. Did he tell you that he believed there was no way to tie them into buying the weapons at the San Diego gun store? Yes, he did. And did he further tell you that there was no way on earth to link them to the murders? Words to that effect, yes. At that point, at the point of learning that um, Lyle Menendez did not know that Eric Menendez had confessed to you, did you uh, have a discussion with Eric Menendez about bringing in Lyle Menendez? Yes, I did. And what, what was that discussion? Well, the discussion, the discussion was that uh, I was extremely concerned. Um, Objection, Your Honor, not responsive. The question is, what was the discussion? All right, uh, is that what you're, you're answering? Uh, yes, I was trying to relate what the discussion was. OK, objection overall. Um, I, I believe at some point after I asked Eric whether Lyle knew that he was confessing uh, to me, uh, I asked him what he felt Lyle, what his response would be um, if I uh, told him, or I mean if he told him, if Eric told him, and uh, he had a response uh, such that he was afraid that uh, Lyle would kill him. Um, and um, and I, I asked him if he, I, I told him that I thought it was important to find out what Lyle's reaction would be because he felt very threatened about telling Lyle and also because very clearly um, Lyle was not a, a patient of mine at that time. Um, Objection, Your Honor, not responsive. Right. Move to strike. Objection is sustained as far as anything beyond um, uh, the first part of that answer and re reference to Lyle uh, at the end of the answer is stricken as non-responsive. Dr. Ozil, did Eric Menendez indicate to you that he believed that his brother would be upset with him because Eric had told you what they had done? That's correct. And at some point, uh, did you call Lyle Menendez in to your office? Uh, yes, after asking Eric's uh, permission to do so. Did you get the permission of uh, Eric Menendez to do so? Yes, I did. Now, in, a, in addition to what you've testified to about Eric Menendez stating that his father was impossible to deal with, he had impossible standards, uh, he was controlling, did Eric Menendez tell you anything about an incident which occurred in Calabasas uh, as being a, a, another reason for Eric Menendez being upset? Your Honor, I think that's awfully vague. I think we should simply direct the witness. Wait, wait. Just state your objection. The objection is vague? It's vague. All right. Do you understand the question? Um, no. Actually, I'd like to have okay. it repeated. Why don't you restate it? I'll ask uh, Dr. Ozil to take a look at page 12 of your notes. Okay. I have page 12. Your Honor, I would at object at this point without clarification that Make sure. Wait a second. Yeah, I would object to anything being elicited from page 12 without a foundation being laid as to what day we're talking about and who's present. Okay, you're moving on to a separate conversation, are you? Yes, Your Honor. A different one. 
Well, you'd have so, to lay some sort of foundation for that before I'll you do that. Do that. No, quite the other way. Dr. Ozeal, did you have another session, um, the, the second session being a joint session with both uh, Eric and Lyle Menendez? That's correct. And this was uh, two days after the October uh, 31st? You're session? referring to the November 2nd second. Second session. Yes. Correct. During that uh, November 2nd session, uh, attended by both Lyle and Eric Menendez, was there a, a conversation about uh, the brothers giving reasons for uh, why they, they wanted to murder their father? Objection, Your Honor, to reading that way. I think that's misstating where the evidence is going. Objection overruled. Um, yes. Uh, Dr. Ozeo, referring to the second, well, the last full paragraph, the second uh, sentence. On page 12, counsel? Yes. I'm sorry, which paragraph and which sentence? It's the, uh, the last full paragraph. Yes. And it's the second sentence. Okay. Did um, Lyle Menendez uh, describe how uh, Jose Menendez had taunted uh, both Eric and himself uh, for the Calabasas burglaries by making fun of Eric and him. I'm going to object to leading at this point, Your Honor. I would rather the witness at least read what's actually written there than have Mr. Kuriyama. Okay, objection is overruled. Uh, this has been a subject of discussion before and that it was agreed that certain questions may be asked in a leading fashion, so objection is overruled. Well, then I would you may proceed. Mr. Kuriyama, misreading. Okay, question. counsel, let's uh, proceed in the way that we had agreed. All right, you may proceed, Mr. Kuriyama. And further, telling, I'll, I'll quote it, telling us how stupid we were for doing it in ways that left the police all sorts of clues as to how it had been done. Did Lyle Menendez uh, make that statement in the presence of Eric Menendez to you on November 2nd? Yes, Lyle did. And what happened right after that? Right after look, he made you, the statement? Yes, if you look at the following paragraph. Um, that Eric and, and Lyle um, discussed that they thought that were it not for the fact that the father had turned them in, that they had uh, committed uh, the Calabasas uh, burglary so perfectly that they would not have been caught. And he specifically mentioned that to you on November 2nd when they were telling you the reasons why they were upset with their father? Your Honor, I'm going to object to that following statement because that misrepresents the evidence. Overall. Is that correct, Dr. Ozeal? Uh, that's correct. Finally, referring to page 19 of your notes, the middle paragraph in the last sentence And this again occurred on November 2nd, 1989. That's correct. That correct? <clears throat> Would you uh, describe for the jurors what uh, Eric Menendez said regarding uh, uh, an inheritance? Um, in the context of talking about how impossible um, the father was, uh, Eric uh, also recounted um, his father's near disinheritance of him um, as an example of one of the uh, things that uh, that led to or was an example of why they had to uh, kill the father. Thank you. I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. All right. And the defense will defer cross-examination until um, after the other testimony of uh, the witness before both juries. That, that's what I understand. Right, that, that was how we we're going to proceed. So what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, um, have the other jury come in, and they'll sit in the courtroom at the same time, and the witness's testimony will resume with uh, both juries present. So uh, it takes us a few minutes to have uh, the center section of the courtroom cleared. So what I would ask that you do is just go into the jury room for the amount of time it takes to get the other jury in and then we'll proceed with both defendants and both juries. Don't discuss this case with anyone, don't form any final opinions about it, and we'll have it back in here in just a few minutes. Have you back in. Case of People versus Eric Menendez and People versus Lyle Menendez. Both juries are now in the courtroom. 
The Lyle Menendez jury is uh, in the audience section. The Eric Menendez jury is in the jury box. And to those in the audience uh, section, the uh, Lyle Menendez jury, good morning. And we're ready to resume with the trial. And um, we have a witness. Um, uh, people may call that witness at this time. People call Dr. Dr. L. Jerome Ozeal, O-Z-I-E-L. All right, Mrs. Bozanich. Thank you. Dr. Ozeal, what do you do for a living, please? I'm a clinical psychologist. On October the 31st of 1989, did you make a telephone call from your office to Lyle Menendez? Yes, I did. And when you had the telephone call with Lyle Menendez, what did you tell him and what did he reply? Um, I told him words to the effect, um, your brother has told me everything. And uh, his response was uh, something like, what do you mean by everything? And I said something about needing to be circumspect, and I thought he would know what I meant, and um, he said he would uh, be right over. At the time that you made the telephone call to Lyle Menendez, was Eric Menendez in the office with you? Yes, he was. About how much time elapsed before Lyle Menendez arrived? Um, I would say maybe only 10, 15 minutes. When Lyle Menendez arrived at your office, and was your office on North Bedford Drive in Beverly Hills at the time? That's correct. When Lyle Menendez arrived at your office, did he enter into the office? Um, he did. And could you please describe his demeanor when he came into the office where you and Eric were? Uh, he was extremely uh, upset, um, threatened, threatening, menacing. He was uh, just uh, extremely, uh, I think, threatened and threatening. And when you say that he was threatened and threatening, did, did he say anything at that time that led you to this conclusion? Well, I think initially um, he, he began, uh, he was very angry at Eric, and uh, he was The answer is stricken. Did he express his anger verbally by saying anything to his brother Eric? Uh, yes, he did. He got into a, a major argument with Eric about uh, how could he have, have uh, done something like this? How could he possibly have uh, told me uh, what they did and, and confessed all this to me? And, and how could he have done it without having first told Lyle um, that he was going to do it? What kind of loyalty did Eric have as a brother? Okay, now, um, let me stop you for a mm -hmm. moment. When he referred to Eric doing it, what was it that Eric had done? Confess the murders. Okay. Now, um, in your testimony right now, you're referring to some notes in front of you. Are those notes that you prepared in relationship to these um, things that you're going to testify to? Yes, these are notes that were prepared shortly after uh, these sessions and <coughs> questions. All right. Now, after, um, could you continue and tell us the remainder of the conversation um, that was done in your presence between yourself and Lyle with Eric there. All right, let's get on to more specifics. All right. Um, did Eric Menendez try to explain to Lyle Menendez at that point why it was that he had confessed to you? Um, yes. All right, and what was Eric's explanation? Lyle. Well, his explanation was that he, he needed to confess uh, uh, to somebody, and he, he needed to confess to me, and he knew that if he had told Lyle about it ahead of time, that, uh, that Lyle would have said, no, absolutely not, and then Eric would have confessed anyway, and they would have had a huge fight over that. Approximately two days later, on November the 2nd of 1989, did you have a second meeting with Eric and Lyle Menendez? Yes. And was this, uh, again, at the office that you've described on North Bedford Drive? It was. And to the best of your recollection, how had this uh, second meeting been arranged? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, was it, um, was it prearranged or was it a spontaneous thing? I guess no, it was prearranged. How did the session begin on November the 2nd? Um, well, the two of them came in together. Um, and uh, when you say, how did it begin? What was the topic that was first discussed, if you recall? Um, 
Um, I think we started talking about how, I started talking about how uh, Lyle and uh, how Eric had no choice but to have uh, really confessed the murders to me, and I was explaining this to Lyle. Um, <coughs> and I, I said that, uh, you know, at, at least it, it might have been some benefit because um, I was a therapist and might be able to help them, and potentially there might be some uh, confidentiality uh, with respect to that. Now, when you say confidentiality, <clears throat> at some point did you explain the concept of confidentiality to them? Um, yes. Was it at this point in the conversation or later on? Well, I, I, first of all, I explained the concept of confidentiality when we initiated treatment. Um, but as far as... But in you, relationship to these two sessions? Yes, in, in relationship to the session November the 2nd, did you explain to Lyle Menendez the parameters of confidentiality and his brother Erica as well? Um, mostly I described the limits of confidentiality and also the parameters of it. All right. Before I get into that, I'm going to ask you some more questions. <coughs> Did you indicate um, to both Eric and Lyle Menendez on November the 2nd of 1989 that you might be able to be helpful to them in the event that they were ever brought to trial? Uh, yes. Could you tell us briefly what that conversation was about? I'm sorry, which date are we referring to? On November the 2nd, yes. when they both came in together, mm -hmm. did you indicate to them that you might be able to piece together some of the family events e in order yes. to provide them with some um, aid or some... Yes, the, the reason I sounded confused about that is that I had a similar conversation, I think, uh, two different occasions with them, so I wasn't sure which one you're referring to, but yes, I did. Strike all of that, Yes, the objection is sustained. The answer is stricken. Um, <coughs> why don't you re-ask that question? Yes, Dr. Oziel, did mm -hmm. you have a conversation near the com near the beginning portion of November the second? Uh, referring to page eight, please, of your notes, the bottom, the last um, s two sentences. Yes. Okay, and. It, during this conversation, what did you tell them about what you might be able to do for them in the event that they were ever brought to trial for their parents' murders? Um, just basically put together some of the factors that had been going on in their uh, family that um, specifically the hatred and, and the emotional um, abuse that they'd had uh, in, with respect to the relationship with their father in particular that could have led to the murder taking place. At that point, did Lyle mention to you that he hadn't thought of the, your possession of this information in that particular way, that it could be of use? That's correct. Okay. And at that point, did you tell him that you had kept notes from the October 31st session and placed them in a safety deposit box? Yes, I did. And what did you tell him that you did in regards to the safety deposit box? Um, I told him that I believe that there were that there were three safety deposit boxes, not, not one, and that I had placed uh, notes in, uh, in the safety deposit box with a note um, or notes that stated that, uh, that if I were to mysteriously disappear or be murdered um, under a certain set of circumstances, a uh, sus suspicious accident, that the notes that I had taken uh, would be revealed. And did you tell um, Lyle and Eric Menendez why you had taken this precaution? Yes, I did. And wh what was your reasoning that you told them? Because I uh, felt in the prior session that uh, they that there was a, sp a strong threat to my life. Now, at that point, did Lyle Menendez respond to you? And I'm referring now to page nine. Uh, the last third of the page. Did Lyle Menendez respond to you after you said that you had felt threatened after October the 31st? Yes, he did. And what did, what did he say to you about that? Well, he, um, he laughed and he said that I should have felt threatened because um, immediately after the session, um, he and Eric had sat in Eric's uh, new Jeep and the first statement that uh, Lyle had made to Eric when he got into the Jeep was, now how do we kill Ozeal? And um, he continued to relate that, uh, that Eric said uh, in this course of this conversation that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't up to killing anybody else right now and uh, that if uh, Lyle wanted to kill me that, uh, that he should go ahead and kill me. Now when was it that 
Eric made the statement um, that he wasn't up to killing anyone else and that Lyle should do it. Was that a statement that occurred in the Jeep or was that a statement that occurred in your office? Well, the initial statement. Well, I think it's, I'm going to object to the form of the question. I don't believe the witnesses testified yet or that Eric testified. All right, why don't you rephrase the question okay. so you clarify exactly what okay. you're asking. Dr. Ozeal, I believe you indicated that um, after you explained the um, fact of the safety deposit boxes and what measures you had taken, that Lyle indicated to you that you should have felt threatened because he and his brother had gone to the Jeep after the October 31st session and had discussed killing you. Is that correct? Yes, they, that's what he related. And, all right. And then what was Eric's response to that, and, and how did that occur? What was his response to it in the session, or what was Lyle's reported response to it in Eric's Jeep? What was Lyle's reported response in Eric's Jeep? You mean Eric's reported response in Lyle's Jeep? Yes. No. Yes. No? What did uh, Lyle Menendez tell you that Eric had told him when they're in the Jeep? Okay. Uh, Lyle Menendez told me that Eric had said that he was not up to killing anybody else right now and that uh, if Lyle wanted to kill me that Lyle should go ahead and kill me. Now, Lyle told you this in, about a conversation that had taken place between himself and his brother about two days before, correct? That's correct. And he told this to you in the presence of his brother, Eric Menendez, is that correct? Yes, he did. Okay. What next happened? Um, well, actually, um, did Lyle both, both Eric and Lyle were, were at this point um, uh, laughing. No, there's no question pending. Y yes, there the was. The objection is overruled. The question is what happened next? What happened next is that uh, Eric and Lyle were um, laughing in the, in the office, uh, both of them, and, um, and Ly did, Lyle said that, I'm sorry. Okay, and then did Lyle relate to you further any conversations that he and his brother had had on the 31st? Yes, he did. And He's, what did he tell you about what they had talked about on the 31st after seeing you? We said that they began laughing um, because they were sitting in the Jeep and looking back up to the office that I was located in, and they were imagining me looking down on the Jeep and seeing them having this discussion and knowing very well that they were planning to kill me, and they were laughing at, you know, at uh, how frightened I must have been realizing that they were sitting in the Jeep uh, talking about planning to kill me. Now, when you, just to clarify, when you say that they were laughing, they were laughing on October 31st in the Jeep, or they were laughing in relating to you what had occurred on the 31st? Um, no, uh, I'm sorry, L Lyle never said, no one ever said that they were laughing when they were in the Jeep until after they began, at the point at which they were sitting in the Jeep and began looking up and imagining me looking down and realizing that they were talking about how to kill me, that uh, that's the point at which they were laughing. But the, he didn't say they were laughing or relate that they were laughing before that. In the office, when it was being relayed to me on November 2nd, they were again laughing. Now, after they or were they were laughing. All right. After it was related to you, um, after it was related to you, um, what had occurred? Did they give an? Did Lyle Menendez give you an explanation for why this hadn't occurred? That is, that or that they had to abandon this idea? Yes, he did. What did he say? Um, he said that um, it it wouldn't look too good if I disappear too soon um, because if I if I did um, that uh, it, it might begin to cast a, you know an unwelcome light on, on them that if the Menendez's therapist disappeared uh, soon and might might not be a good idea after and, then, and then after that he I'm sorry okay and and then after that did Lyle turn to you and say something yes he did did he ask you a question yes he did what did he ask you he asked me if I was frightened. And what did you respond? About what he had just told me. And I, I said that I, I really didn't uh, choose to live in fear um, ordinarily. It wasn't how I, I really chose to live my life. And what did he respond to you when you said that you did not choose to live your life in fear? He said, neither did my father. Did you go on to explain um, that your point and what your point was in having them there? 
Yes. And what did you tell them? Well, I, I told them that uh, that uh, if that anybody could be killed, and uh, that I I got the message. But the the uh, the point was that uh, that I thought that what we were trying to do here was to try to work to to help resolve whatever issues they had emotionally, to that to led them to commit the uh, murder to begin with. Did they continue on to tell you that they had hated their father and why they had to kill him? Yes. Referring now to bottom of page 10 in your notes? Yes, I did. Okay. W could you please tell us, this discussion was had, was it had by both defendants or by one or the other? How did that occur? Um, it was in a mutual discussion between the two of them. And what did they explain to you about why they had killed their father? Well, that basically that they hated their father, that they, uh, they felt they had to kill him because uh, he was constantly, uh, this was a lengthy conversation that they, they he ridiculed them, he, he put them down, he controlled their every uh, activity, he controlled them in all ways, he uh, made them feel not adequate, he, he made them feel inferior, he, uh, he dominated them, he, you know, couldn't, uh, couldn't be pleased. Um, that he he preached uh, living perfectly in a higher moral level, but then at the same time he would say other things that that, that were very confusing to them. Um, okay, now let mm -hmm. me ask you this: uh -huh. after they told you about the fact that he preached morality to them, but that he did things that might have been inconsistent, did you point this out to them? Um, yes, I did. And um, what did what was their response to your pointing out to them the inconsistency between their father? preaching morality, but then treating them the way he did. Um, could you ask me that more specifically? All right. Um, did, you, did you ask the defendants if this appeared to be, in, that the father's conduct appeared to be incompatible with being a moral person? Yes, I did. I, I, uh, did they express to you some confusion over their father? Yes, they did. They said that they were confused because they saw him as being a, um, a moral person, and they didn't really know of any um, behavior that he engaged in that was uh, that was immoral. Now, did they indicate to you that they wanted to write a book about their father? Yes, I did. And uh, did they indicate to you was the book going to be praiseworthy or condemnatory? Do you recall? It, it was um, in the extreme going to be praiseworthy. Now, did they indicate to you at that point um, one of the reasons? in light of this novel that they wanted to write, one of the reasons they had killed him. Um, what, I don't understand uh, what did, you're asking. Did the defendants indicate to you that they considered it a, an accomplishment to have killed their father? Um, yes, that um, most particularly with how, how well it had been done. Now, at some point during this portion of the discussion, and I'm referring now to your notes on page 11, the largest paragraph, um, did you ask them about their mother? Yes, I did. And did, they, did you ask them why they killed their mother? Yes, I did. And what was the explanation given to you? Well, the explanation was, um, was that the mother was, um, when, when Lyle and Eric were both there, they had a discussion. And the context of the discussion was um, that the mother was more or less a, um, a victim, uh, that she was a victim of the father, that the father had, had nothing but an abusive relationship with her, and that she, had, she was controlled by him, and she was um, miserable, that she had been suicidal, um, and that they couldn't conceive of her being able to um, live uh, effectively or wanting to live effectively if the father wasn't there uh, or was murdered anyway, and also that the mother was a, um, a witness. And if, in fact, they left the mother um, alive, they couldn't think of any way to be able to kill the father and escape uh, detection. So the only way that they knew of to be able to kill the father was also to kill the mother. And this was, a, this was an issue that they had gone back and forth and debated about. Um, prior to the murder. Um, well, pardon me, but what was the issue that they had gone back and forth <coughs> over and debated about? Whether the mother really should be killed um, because their emotional sense, as they related to me, was that 
the mother didn't deserve to be killed um, on her own and for, for who she was, um, but yet they couldn't find or figure any way to be able to proceed with murdering the father without also murdering the mother. And so their overall conclusion was that the only way that they could commit this, achieve this end of um, murdering the father was to also murder the mother. And then in addition to that, they, they, or I should also say, as a part of that decision, they also felt that they were putting the mother out of her misery, that she was a, uh, that she was a miserable, unhappy lady, and uh, by killing her, they would be uh, putting her out of her misery. Did they indicate to you anything about the, the plan to murder the parents? In other words, how, anything about making a perfect plan or about killing the parents? Yes, I did. Okay, and was that in relationship to this explanation of killing the mother? Well, it, it followed the conversation. Yeah. Um, and, and yes, there, there was a, a conversation about that. Did they indicate to you that part of the reason that the mother was killed is the plan to kill the father included her and that the plan was very good and they didn't want to deviate from it? I want to check that, Jerry. Miss and it's a leading question. All right, why don't you uh, refer the witness to the specific uh, page, if you could. I'm referring now to the bottom of page 11, Dr. Ozeal, the last sentence, and up until the page 12, the first paragraph. Why don't you um, review your notes and then tell us what was said about plan? Um, Eric and Lyle felt that the plan that they had formed to commit the murder was a, a perfect plan. They felt it was a plan that, that wouldn't allow for any detection of it, and they could not figure out a way to um, kill the father without, without also killing the mother. And so um, they felt if they didn't kill the mother, they wouldn't have any way to proceed with killing the father. So uh, although they actually felt their mother didn't uh, Overruled. All right, you may continue. Although they felt that the mother didn't deserve to die and shouldn't die, they included her in the plan along with killing their father because it was the only way that they could figure out to kill their father. And during this discussion, did they uh, use the word perfect in terms of the crime? <coughs> to the best of my recollection, yes, I did. Subsequent to this, did um, Eric Menendez, in the <coughs> presence of his brother Lyle Menendez, relate to you something about the mother locking the bedroom? Yes, he did. What did he tell you in the presence of his <coughs> brother? He told me that, um, that several days um, before the uh, murder, that uh, Eric uh, said that he began to feel bad because he began to notice that his mother was getting uh, very nervous and agitated and began locking the doors to the bedroom. and he felt that she probably had a sense that uh, something very ominous um, was going to happen to her. And that's why she was, that she, in a sense, knew that it was going to happen. And that's why she began locking the door. And then at that point, did Lyle tell you something about the, the father? Um, yes, that the, the father made some sort of comment about, uh, you can kill me if, uh, if you want to, but, um, but you won't get any money if you do, words to that effect. Now referring to page 13, Dr. Oziel. Yes. Subsequent to this discussion about the mother and the father, as related to you by Eric and Lyle Menendez, did Eric say anything about he and his brother having a discussion about what might happen to them one day if they had children? Yes, he did. And what did he say to you? Uh, Eric said that he and Lyle had discussed the possibility that someday, that if they had children, that their children might uh, rise up and kill them. At that point, did Lyle... As they kill their parents, yeah. At that point, did Lyle Menendez indicate to you any feelings of sadness he might have had about his mother? Yes, he did. And what did he tell you? In the, and this was in the presence of his brother, is that correct? Yes, it was. What did he tell you? Um, he told me that he was very sad about um, having um, killed uh, his mother, and he, he didn't even like to think about the fact that, uh, that he had killed his mother. 
He told me that he didn't have um, any real maternal feelings toward her and he didn't really respond to her as being a, a mother figure. Um, he saw her as a, as, a, as a pitiful person, somebody who was um, just completely dominated by, um, by the father, Jose, and that she had a lot of potential and that there, she was very bright and there were all sorts of things she maybe could have been, but that she really never was able to do any of those things. And then did he acknowledge something to you about his mother? Um, what are you referring in to? In terms of participating in her murder? Yes, he did. What did he tell you? Um, he acknowledged that he fired the shots that, um, that actually killed his mother in the end. Okay. Now, I believe you've testified um, that about Lyle and Eric Menendez. Do you see them both in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. And where is Eric Menendez seated? Your Honor, we'll stipulate that the witness knows the All right. That's fine. All right, you can ask a question if you want. That's fine. I, I, All right, do I both sides the uh, stipulate then that the witness is uh, identifying the defendants at council table? Yes, sir. All right. All right, how much more do you have to go? Um, well, let's just take a break yeah, here so that we can resume yeah, quite that. quite a bit. Okay. We'll resume at 1.30, ladies and gentlemen. Don't discuss this case with anyone. Um, referring to both juries now, don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. It's important that you not uh, be in a position where you hear anybody else discussing this case um, or be exposed to anything, whether it's news coverage or anything else that might discuss this case or mention it in any way. So we'll be in recess and see you all back here at 1.30. Um, the uh, blue jury come into this jury room, the gold jury go next door, and when everyone is here, we'll resume at 1.30. Trial. The defendants are both in court with their lawyers and the prosecution is represented and all of the jurors, both juries are present and uh, we'll resume now with the testimony of the witness. Uh, Dr. Ozeal, would you resume the witness stand please? Would you state your name for us, please? Yes, Dr. L. Jerome Ozeal. And uh, you may continue your direct examination. Thank you, Dr. Ozeal, referring now to page 14 of the notes that you have. Yes. Uh, we're referring now to the November 2nd meeting, is that correct? That's correct. Um, did you have any discussion with them about whether or not they had killed their parents for money? Yes. Could you tell us what was said, please? All right, if you can uh, clarify that, please. Okay, do you, um, do you know if one person, one of the two defendants was saying this or were they both saying it together? Was it a discussion? How did it occur? Um, both brothers were, were talking about this, it was a discussion, and um, did you want me to go into the essential elements of the discussion? What, was the ele what were the elements of the discussion? Um, they were concluding that they, they really didn't kill their parents for money, but out of the hatred that they had, uh, in particular towards their father, and uh, to be free from all of the uh, the abusive and, and onerous characteristics that the father had, dominating them, uh, having them feel inadequate, inferior, uh, exacting impossible standards, controlling their life, so on and so forth. Some point after that, did you describe for them two different kinds of killings? Yes, I did. Could you tell the jury what you told them, please? Um, I described um, one pattern of killing um, and uh, that related to certain characteristics. It had to do with uh, being premeditated, um, involving um, sort of a, a plan, a, um, a job that needed to be accomplished uh, where the, the killing was in fact uh, something that was like a, a job that had to get done and get accomplished, that feelings um, where there either weren't many feelings about it or whatever feelings that there were really didn't get in the way of it. Did and you contrast that kind of killing with another kind? Yes, I did. And what was the other kind that you described to the two defendants? Uh, the other 
kind of uh, killing that I described was a killing, uh, if you will, out of intense emotion, something that, uh, that occurred, um, a, a crime of passion type of killing, um, where there wasn't any premeditation and it wasn't a logical, rational uh, plan um, to murder someone. It was just uh, coming in, for example, to find something very emotional happening in one's life and grabbing the nearest knife or pistol or something and in the heat of the moment shooting someone. So a, a lack of premeditation and something arising um, primarily out of emotion, not out of thought and rationale and plan and logic. Did each of the two defendants um, acknowledge to you after you described these two kinds of killings um, which one was more applicable to their situation? Yes, they did. And as to the defendants, what did they, what did they indicate? Th they indicated that the former pattern, the logical, rational, thought-out pattern, was in fact the one that characterized um, the, uh, their acts in relationship to the murder. Referring now to page 17, Dr. Ozil. Did the <coughs> defendants have conversations with you about the, the notes that you were keeping? Uh, yes, they did. And what was said? Uh, I, I'm not seeing where on the page. At oh, the you're. Bottom of the page. Okay. Um, ah, yes. I had told them that I was keeping notes of the sessions and um, also that if anything happened to me, if I mysteriously disappeared or was murdered or had a suspicious accident, that the notes would in fact um, be revealed publicly. And they were very concerned that uh, what if somebody else um, killed me? What if, uh, what if there was a, something that looked like a suspicious accident or someone murdered me or whatever, um, and even if it wasn't them, that these notes would nonetheless get released and, and uh, all of this would, uh, would become public. Now, did you have a further discussion with them about how the family looked to outsiders? Yes. Could you tell us about that, please? Well, actually, it was, it was less a discussion I had with them and more a discussion that they were having between the two of them, and I was listening to it. And what, what did that discussion center on? Uh, it centered on the extent to which the, uh, f the family looked perfect, like the ideal family to the outside world. Um, but that in reality, um, that it, it was a, a uh, disastrously uh, negative family, that the marriage between the uh, two parents was, was a, uh, a very terrible marriage, that the, the mother and father had almost uh, you know, no relationship except a negative and emotionally abusive relationship with the father being the, uh, the abuser. Um, and that the, the sons uh, felt that they had uh, nothing but distance towards uh, and with respect to the father, criticism, rejection, humiliation, and that they also didn't really have a close or, or nurturing relationship with the mother, so that the, the family's reality had um, next to nothing to do with and in fact was the opposite of the perception of the family in the world. Did they express to you any conflict that they felt inside about their opinion towards their father? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Did they ever tell you about both hating and loving their father? Yes. Okay, what was um, said about that? Well, actually, they didn't talk about loving their father. That would be incorrect. They, they talked about idolizing their father, but I don't recall that either Eric or Lyle ever used the word love with respect to their father. I don't believe they did. Um, they, I think, uh, were more in some ways in awe of their father. They saw him as a very powerful person because he had been controlling them, um, you know, for, for much of their life. And uh, that's more what they described. And did they say anything about how they felt about themselves for having accomplished his killing? Yes. I, I think in relation to that, they, they felt like they had, you know, in, innate the fact that they were able to kill the father and, and complete this act, um, I think was, was almost a way of vindicating that they had a level of, uh, of power themselves to be able to do it. That was their statement. They stated that, uh, that um, they finally had gotten to the place where they did something perfect. Now, did Lyle Menendez in the presence of his brother indicate to you anything about um, getting down details of these sessions? 
Yes, he did. And what did he say? Um, he, he basically um, said that he wanted to uh, make sure that all of the mitigating details of, of their background and whatever happened to them could be down so that in the event there ever, uh, there ever was a trial that um, these mitigating factors could be brought out. And, and so he suggested um, that maybe in the future... Um, did he suggest making notes? Uh, no. Did he suggest keeping... Did he want you to memorialize what had been said? Yes, he did. Now, later on, did Lyle give you a specific instance about um, how his father had been abusive towards him involving his dating? Yes. Okay. Could you explain to the jury what was said? Um, Lyle mentioned that he had been uh, dating uh, someone that he had felt was, uh, was a, uh, a difficult person to date. It was an accomplishment. The, I think it was the Rose Festival Queen and a billboard model, and that is uh, two different women. Um, and that his uh, uh, father even ridiculed and made fun of those two women that he was dating and called them both bimbos. And uh, it was just an example on Lyle's part of how uh, he was never able to please his father, no matter what he did, and that he didn't feel he, he ever could have pleased his father. At the end of the session, did you have any conversation about uh, where the defendants were going to go? in the near future? Yes. And could you briefly tell us about that, please? Well, they asked me um, where they could uh, stay on the island of Kauai, that they were planning to, uh, to vacation in Kauai, and that they uh, planned to leave for about a week. And uh, so that was a discussion that we had. Dr. Ozeal, during the course of your testimony, you've been making <coughs> reference to notes, and I've been making reference to pages of those notes. Subsequent to November the 2nd, did you in fact uh, memorialize what uh, you had heard during the October 31st and November 2nd sessions? Um, subsequent to the November 2nd session? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. And did you in fact make verbal notes on a cassette tape of what had been said to you on those two occasions? That's correct. And what you've been referring to, is that a transcript of those notes? Yes, it is. After you made that cassette, did you put it someplace? Uh, yes. And where did you put it? Safety deposit box. On March the 8th of 1990, uh, did the police come to your house and eventually seize the tape from your safety deposit box? Yes, they did. And are you testifying here today under court order? Yes, I am. Objection is overruled, and don't argue the matter. Objection like, overruled. Can you maybe be heard? No, objection overruled. I am testifying here under court order. Thank you. I have nothing further at this time. All right. Um, who wishes to proceed with cross examination first? I thought there was more direct, Your Honor, with Did the you want to do that first? Yes, I believe okay. that was the protocol. All right. Then that's what we'll do. Um, how long do you think that'll take? 15 minutes. All right. Um, we will proceed with the uh, hearing, um, or the testimony of the witness, uh, and it will be with um, the Lyle Menendez jury. The Eric Menendez jury will be excused uh, for the period of time of this testimony. And as I've indicated before, when these things happen, when one jury is in the courtroom and the other jury is not, you are instructed you must not speculate about what's going on in the courtroom when you're away from the courtroom you must make your decision based only on the evidence you hear in the courtroom while you're in the courtroom All right. what we'll do is have the Eric Menendez jury take your break at this point uh, uh, and return at 2.30 uh, don't discuss this case with anyone don't form any final opinions about it and we'll resume at 2.30 and we'll resume as soon as you folks have left so we'll see you back here at 2.30 Let's resume with the uh, testimony of uh, Dr. Ozeal before the Lyle Menendez jury only. Dr. Ozeal, referring back to the October 31st session, um, just to briefly recap, um, you had some conversation with Lyle Menendez after he arrived at your office, is that correct? That's correct. And um, did, now we're referring to page seven of your notes, the, the first sentence, the first full sentence. Yes. 
Uh, did Lyle Manette express anything about how he felt about what had happened with you and his brother? Yes, he did. Okay, what did he say? Um, well, he said that uh, it was extremely stupid that Eric told me and had confessed all the details of the crime to me and that there was uh, someone who knew now, namely me, and that it wasn't a perfect murder anymore and that uh, it was a very, very big problem for him um, that, that I knew and that I was the only person who had this information. Um, he was uh, very fearful that, uh, that I would uh, tip the police or tip the newspapers. He didn't believe that there was any way for him to be safe now that I had this information. Um, and basically made a number of statements that had to do with it was a very big problem that I knew and he'd have to figure out just what to do about this problem and this wasn't good and uh, uh, he was very menacing. We have it established as to when this occurred, where it occurred, I'm and who sorry, else was right. present, please. All right. Um, did this occur after Lyle Menendez had come to your office on October the 31st, which was the first session we've talked about in your testimony? That's correct. And at the time that Lyle Menendez said this to you, was anyone else in the room aside from yourself and Lyle Menendez? Yes. Who? Eric Menendez. And about how long after Lyle Menendez got to your office was it that he expressed the sentiments that you just relayed to the jury? Uh, I would say that he began expressing uh, threatening or menacing comments pretty soon, almost immediately after he walked into the room. Um, and the menacing comments really were interspersed throughout the entire time that, uh, that Lyle was in this first session with Eric. And how much time did you actually spend in this session where, you, where Lyle Menendez was present? I would estimate that it was about 25% uh, of the total time. I believe that the, the total amount of time was approximately four hours. So that would be approximately an hour? Approximately an hour. All right. Um, did he indicate to you anything about people looking over his shoulder? Yes, he did. Could you tell us what he said? Yes. Um, he, a after, well, first, uh, he asked me something about, uh, or we discussed something about confidentiality, and, and after discussing that, what the limits of it were, uh, he was pretty much dismissive of that and said, he was talking about how the fact he just didn't feel safe and that uh, there, there wasn't any way to feel safe. Um, and I told him that I, I was feeling that he was specifically threatening and menacing to me. And he uh, just glared at me and said that he didn't want to have anybody looking over his shoulder, and that's why he killed his parents to begin with. And I took that to mean that he was thinking of killing me. All right, now, Dr. Ozil, at some point, did, did Lyle um, begin to leave the session? Yes, he did. At the time that he began to leave the session, had Eric Menendez already left? Yes, he did. At what point was it that Eric Menendez left? Was it during part of the conversation you've related to us? Um, yes, as the as Lyle's comments got more and more menacing, and he was more and more um, um, threatening and unhappy. Uh, first of all, some of it was I think directed towards Eric for having told me to begin with, and then and then a lot of it was directed towards me. Eric was getting uh, increasingly agitated and upset, and I think at one point he you know he buried his head in his hands and he he bolted out of the session, um, and. Uh, ended up going downstairs. All right, did you in fact, um, let me back up. At some point Lyle began to leave the session, is that correct? That's correct. Did you express anything to him about what you wanted him to do? Uh, yes, what? I suggested and, or, and told him that I thought that the, the two of them uh, should come back in the office and try to work through or talk about uh, what had just gone on, that I was feeling extremely threatened and that I'd, I'd just been threatened and uh, that, that I didn't feel comfortable ending the session at this point because I felt that, uh, you know, that I was getting the clear message that they were, that he at least was planning to, uh, to do something to me. And uh, he, did, he said he wasn't going to come back to the session. He wanted to talk to his little brother and he said that uh, basically he, uh, he um, just wanted to go talk to his little brother before he decided whether or not he was going to talk to me anymore at all. Did, um, okay, let me ask you a question. Did you leave the building? Yes, I did. 
And when you left the building, were we you? We did. I'm sorry. Okay. Were you in Lyle Menendez's company when you left the building? Yes. He, w he was leaving the office to go and be with Eric, and I was following after him, telling him that I really thought that we needed to come back and talk about this, that this was not a good way to leave the session. Did you and he then go out onto the street? That's correct. And was somebody waiting out on the street? Well, Eric was sitting in his Jeep, as I recall. And um, at some on, point? At the street. All right, so he was in the Jeep on the street. That's right. Okay. Um, did you then have some concluding remarks with Lyle Menendez? Uh, yes. Could you tell us about that, please? Yes. Um, after he told me that he, he wasn't sure that he wanted to talk to me anymore at all, uh, I um, concluded that was extremely menacing. And he just uh, shook my hand and, and said, uh, you know, good luck, Dr. Ozil, which I took, again, to be menacing and threatening. What, what was the tone of voice he used with you when he said, good luck, Dr. Ozil? Was it friendly? Was it? No, was it was it? an ominous sort of good luck, Dr. Ozil. I mean, like a, a threatening good luck, Dr. Ozil. It definitely wasn't a uh, friendly good luck, Dr. Ozil. Did you then go back inside of your office? Uh, yes, I did. Referring now to page 10 of your notes and moving ahead in time to the November 2nd session. Correct. Um, After the beginning of the November 2nd session, did you indicate that you wanted to continue some sort of d discourse or dialogue with um, Lyle Menendez in order to aid him? Uh, yes. Okay, and what was his response to that? I'm not, could you ask the question more specifically? Okay. I'm not sure what you're referring to. I'm referring to the, the first full paragraph on the page. On page? 10. Page 10. All right. Okay. Did, did you tell Lyle Menendez that you wanted to work on something with him? Ah, uh, yes. I'm okay. sorry, I was looking at the wrong paragraph. Yes. Okay, and what did you tell him you wanted to work on? Um, I just told him that I wanted to work on whatever it was that caused he and Eric to uh, murder their parents. And what did he reply to that? That he didn't think there was anything uh, to work on because what caused uh, him to commit the murders wasn't here anymore. They were both dead. Moving ahead to page 12, Dr. Ozeal. Referring to the second full paragraph, um, did Lyle Menendez ever express to you um, an opinion on his part about how his father would have felt about what had happened? Yes, he did. Okay, could you tell us about that? Yes, he, um, he said that he thought his father would have been uh, proud of him for killing him. And did he explain why he thought his father would have been proud? Yes. He, first of all, he said that he, he uh, knew that his, his father, he knew that his father knew that he should have been killed. And he also said that he would have been proud of the good job that he did. Referring now to page 14. The first full paragraph. Did you have a discussion with Lyle Menendez in the presence of his brother Eric Menendez about the question of an inheritance? Yes. Okay, could you tell us what was said during that discussion, please? Um, I asked if they felt guilty having uh, millions of dollars from their parents' inheritance, and uh, Lyle laughed and said, uh, no, but this wasn't done for the money. And uh, they thought that if their father was, in fact, uh, was alive, that he would have continued to double his net worth um, on a regular basis because he was actually on the ascendancy in terms of what he was earning. Did he explain anything to you about the possibility of another will? Yes, he did. And what was said by Lyle Menendez regarding that topic? Well, he asked me if I'd heard uh, about the will situation, and, and um, I recall that I said I hadn't. And um, he then told me that they had suspected that there was another will. Okay, did he tell you who had suspected? Do you recall if he told you who suspected there was I think was it was his uncle that had suspected that, uh, that there was another will. Um, which, which I think he related both Eric and Lyle had, um, had also suspected, which would have uh, disinherited uh, Lyle and Eric, and that he, um, what did you want me to? Yeah, and what, did he say anything that he'd done in relationship to the possibility of this will? Yes. What did he say? He did. Um, we found a file called Will on, um, on the computer uh, that they had at home that uh, their mother had used. And um, Lyle arranged to have the entire hard disk erased so that uh, 
none of the files could be brought up again, so there were only, I guess, zeros, and there weren't any uh, actual letters that could be read. Um, and this was to uh, erase the possibility of discovering a will that, that would have disinherited Lyle and Eric, although Lyle did state that he didn't really believe that there was a new will that would have disinherited him. Referring now to page 16 of your notes. <clears throat> and referring specifically to your notes, did Lyle may express any concern to you at this November 2nd session about the possibility of what would happen with your notes if someone else read them? Yes, he did. Okay. What did he say? Um, he said that it was very important that the notes never get read. Um, one of his cousins apparently had said that they would cut off the hands of uh, anyone who they ever found that killed Jose and Kitty. And he also talked about uh, the fact that it would be uh, very embarrassing if it ever came out that they had killed their parents. Now lastly, re referring to page 17 of your notes, and again in reference to your keeping of the notes, did Lyle ex express anything about how he felt about the possibility of these notes getting read by someone else and how that might occur? Yes. Okay, what did he, what did he say? Well, he was very concerned about um, someone else harming me and, and therefore having the notes come out. So he, he made a, a joke about us uh, having to be very good friends and that if somebody broke into my house and robbed me or, and began to shoot me, if I heard a shot behind me and saw the robber drop, uh, I'd probably see Lyle behind saying, uh, have a good night's sleep, Jerry. Words to that effect. Thank you very much, Dr. Ozil. I have no further questions at this time. <clears throat> All right. Then um, we'll take a recess and resume at um, 2.30. Do counsel have anything you want to discuss before the uh, cross-examination begins? All right, then we'll resume at 2.30, ladies and gentlemen. Don't discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else, and don't let anyone discuss it in your presence. And uh, we'll resume at 2.30. Um, the jury of Lyle Menendez, if you would report back next door, and we'll check you in, and then the other jury will check in here, and then when you're all present, we'll have you come in. All right, we'll see you at 2.30. All parties are present. Uh, the <coughs> juries are both present for uh, both defendants, and we're ready to resume. Uh, Dr. Ozil, would you um, get back on the witness stand for us, please? All right, um, cross-examination on behalf of the defendant, Eric Menendez. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Sir, you testified that you have a PhD in psychology, is that correct? I, I believe I testified that I was a psychologist. Do you have correct. a PhD in psychology? Yes, I do. Uh, there are different types of psychology, um, are there not? Yes, there are. And there are different degrees in psychology, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, your degree is in clinical psychology, yes? That's correct. And what is a clinical psychologist supposed to do? A clinical psychologist is supposed to practice psychology with people who are seeking counseling for psychological or psychiatric purposes. When you say people seeking counseling, are these frequently people seeking help? I think that they would be people seeking help in, in general. And would you say in general people who go to clinical psychologists seeking help are people who have some sort of problems with their life or emotional problems or both? Yes, I would say that's ordinarily true. And to your knowledge, do both adults or do all of the following, adults <clears throat> and children and adolescents uh, use the services of clinical psychologists? I think that adults, children, adolescents, families, marriages, all sorts of uh, people who are seeking counsel or, or help with emotional problems use clinical psychologists for those services. And is it a basic tenant of the psychologist-patient relationship that what a person tells their psychologist is ordinarily private. 
ordinarily what a patient tells a psychotherapist is private. Is that yes? I think I just said ordinarily it's private. And in fact, isn't it a basic tenant of effective psychotherapy that the patient be confident that what they tell their psychologist is like what they tell their priest, confidential? The objection argument is sustained. Is it a basic tenant of therapeutic treatment that patients be told that what they tell their psychologists are like what they tell their priest, confidential. No, I, I wouldn't ever make the, uh, the analogy that what patients uh, tell their psychotherapist is the equivalent of what they tell their priest. Well, isn't it a basic, an accepted notion in clinical psychology that unless a patient believes what they're saying is confidential, it's unlikely that they will be totally forthcoming or trusting of their therapist so as to share their pain and their problems. Objection sustained. In your training and education, were you trained and educated in informing your patients that they were free to tell you things because what they told you was confidential? Objection irrelevant. Overruled. Uh, I was trained that that was something that uh, I would tell patients with exceptions and in fact uh, that's not the, an the answer is uh, no. I was not trained to tell people that what they told me was confidential in an absolute sense. So when your patients come to you, you tell them that what they tell you is not confidential. Is that what you're saying? I don't believe I said that. I well, do you tell your patients that, that what they tell you is not <coughs> confidential? Uh, no. Are you free, generally speaking, to tell other people what your patients tell you in therapy? Generally speaking, no. And do you tell your patients, generally speaking, what they tell you is confidential? Uh, I tell them specifically that what they tell me is confidential except for the limitations to confidentiality in psychotherapy. So you tell them generally it's confidential unless certain things are true or certain things happen? Uh, Overruled. Uh, could you repeat the question? Could the reporter read it back, Your Honor? Yes. Unless certain things are true or certain things happen. Yes? I would say that's true. Now, apart from receiving a PhD in clinical psychology, did you also obtain certain specialty certificates uh, or yes. certifications? Mm, yes. And are your specialty certifications in, number one, phobia and anxiety disorders? Um, I don't have a specialty certificate in phobia and anxiety disorders. I do specialize in treating phobia and anxiety disorder problems. So you do not have a certification in phobia and anxiety disorders from the Phobia Society of America, or do you? Uh, the answer would be that the Phobia Society of America is not to the best of my recollection, a certifying agency or body. I am a member of the Phobia Society of America, and uh, um, I do have the equivalent of something that is a uh, something that is a document that you uh, one puts on the wall if one wishes that represents that you're a member of the organization. But I don't know that it's a certifying body. So it is not a certification. Is that right? I don't I don't know whether it is or it isn't. I don't uh, recall. Well, would it be proper to call it a certification? I'm sorry? Would it be proper to call it a certification? I just don't remember now whether it is a certification or it isn't. It may say on the, uh, on the uh, certificate or piece of uh, parchment that it is a, uh, a certification. I just don't recall it. Did you list it on your curriculum vitae as a certification? I may well have. Even though you don't know if it is? Well, maybe it is. I'm just saying I don't recall now whether it is or it isn't at the moment. Now, do you have a certification uh, as a diplomate, as a board-certified sex therapist from the American Board of Sexology? Yes, I do. And are you a certified sex therapist from the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists? Um, 
yes. And are you a certified, so. excuse me? I believe so, meaning I believe all these are, are up to date and so on and so forth. I don't know when that VITA was and I don't recall whether uh, some of these uh, cert certificates are uh, current or not. So I, I don't know what the document is that you're reading from. And, at uh, some point did you have the certificates yes. that I've just read? That's correct. And at some point uh, were you a certified sex educator from the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors and Therapists? That would be correct. And at some point were you a certified sexologist of the American College of Sexologists? Uh, I believe so, yes. And now have I read to you all of the areas of which you are or were or believe you are or were certified? Um, I don't know. Uh, you're holding my VITA and I haven't probably looked at it for several years, so I, I so don't recall. So you need to see your VITA to know what your specialties are? No, I just don't recall whether I have certifications in areas that uh, you didn't read off. I may or may not. Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm holding a document entitled Curriculum V-Type 1988, name Jerome Ozil, PhD. Sir, why don't you look over this document? I haven't marked it yet. And see if that appears to be a copy of your CV as of 1988. Um, it says 1988 on it. I haven't uh, seen this in a very long time. It does appear to be a copy of a CV, and I don't know when the CV was done. Well, you did it. Uh, it was typed by someone other than myself. I just don't remember when it was done. I have no recollection. It does say 1988 on it, though. Well, why don't you look it over and see if it appears to have all of your achievements and accomplishments as of 1988 contained therein? Are you referring specifically to certification, or are you referring to the entire document? Whatever it takes for you to convince yourself as to its date of preparation or accuracy as of a particular year. Um, in looking at the certification, it uh, appears as if um, those would be the, the fields that I was certified in as of uh, 1988, to the and best of my did recollection. Did I, by the way, read them off accurately? I believe you did. Anything else in the document that informs you as to when it was prepared? Mm. <coughs> not really. Not that I can see, no. It has a list, does it not, somewhere in the midst of uh, publications. Is that correct? The articles and books that you either wrote or co-wrote or edited. That's if you could go back to the podium, it would help so we could hear your voice. Uh, I wanted to turn away, so does it have a list of publications that you uh, either wrote or co-wrote or edited? Yes, it does. Go back to the podium. Does it have um, a listing of lectures and presentations of various kinds that you made? Um... Just one moment. Uh, yes, it does. And uh, do the dates of those presentations and publications well, seem to correlate that that's uh, your CV as of 1988? No. Not really. Um, the, the dates appear to stop in 1979. And um, so uh, what I'm wondering is if uh, maybe um, the year 1988 was typed on this, but the Vita is a very old Vita because this is uh, the, the presentations stop almost a full decade, if not longer than that, before the date on the Vita. Well, who would have done that, Dr. Rosia? Who would have typed 1988 on a very old Vita of yours? Uh, uh, that could have been a secretary or anybody in my office who, was, uh, who had a request to submit a VITA for some purpose. Did you have an um, uh, obligation to submit a VITA to counsel for Judalon Smith in a lawsuit between the two of you? I don't recall that. I mean, it's possible that I did.
Now, when you look at the articles and the books and the lectures that are listed in that Vita, would it be fair to say that the vast majority of those things uh, which you either wrote or spoke on deal with sex therapy? Um, I would say that the majority appear to deal with uh, sex therapy. I, I don't know about the vast majority. I haven't taken the time to peruse it. And uh, in your clinical practice, uh, do you advertise in various yellow pages and such? Uh, yes. As of 1989, uh, did you, uh, 1989 to 1990, did you advertise as a sex therapist? Uh, no, I didn't advertise myself as a sex therapist. There probably was a, um, a, an advertisement saying something like uh, sexual counseling services or, or marital counseling services. I under your name or under the name of some organization of which you were a director? Uh, I don't recall anything about uh, me being a director of it. It was a long time ago, but uh, I think it was just a, a DBA or a name of a, uh, um, just a referral service number to call if people were interested in that kind of uh, treatment. Why don't we back up? In 1988, 89, 1990, you had offices, private offices, correct? That's correct. And they were on Bedford Drive in Beverly Hills? That's correct. And you had telephone numbers uh, to that office? That's correct. And did you advertise in telephone directories under your name? Yes, I believe so. And did you, in those advertisements, hold yourself out to be a sex therapist or someone who was providing sex therapy or sexual counseling? I believe so. And do you believe that you also held yourself out as someone who treated phobias and obsessive compulsive disorders? I don't recall whether I did or didn't uh, hold myself out to be uh, someone who treated obsessive compulsive disorders. I would, the best of my recollection would be that probably that I did uh, state that I treated um, phobia related problems. Now, to the best of your recollection, uh, at any time from 1988 through 1990, did you ever hold yourself out as an expert in adolescent adjustment disorders? Uh, hold myself out, do you mean, did I advertise myself? Yes. No. Did you ever not. write an article on that topic? No, I did not. Did you ever lecture on that topic? Uh, no, I did not. Did you ever appear on television discussing that topic? I certainly did not. Well, you did appear on television discussing other topics, didn't you? Um, yes, I believe I did. In fact, you listed them in your Vita. Correct? You can point that out to me. Well, do you remember that that would be something that you would put in your CV, your television appearances? I don't know. I haven't seen that in, uh, in a number of years. You're refreshing my memory. Do you have a current Vita, Dr. Rozio? Um I'm sure I do somewhere, but I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at it for some time. Turning your attention to page six of this document under the heading Television invited interviews. Does that have a list of television appearances that you made? Yes, it does. And can you tell me the date of the latest television appearance that appears on that CD? Um, it is 1988. Why don't you keep reading? Oh, there's one that says 1990. <clears throat> so that does not appear to be an old, outdated CV. That appears to be a CV at least from some point in 1990, correct? Um, uh, it looks like someone used it in 1990, but the information in the, C in the CV is not 19, uh, it's not an updated, I think somebody may have typed that onto an old Vita, which is what I think happened. Okay, well did you appear on 48 Hours on the CBS television in 1990? Um, to be honest, I don't recall. I'm assuming I did. Did you appear on cable, VH1, in 1989? Uh, I'm assuming I appeared on all of the things listed there. I just don't have vivid recollections of any particular TV shows I did or didn't appear on. How about Fox 11, an AIDS special in 1988? Does that, uh, do you remember that? I remember having, um, having had been part of an AIDS panel uh, that was televised, so yes, that rings a bell. That's yes? Rings a bell, yes. How about uh, on the CBS Network News in 1988? Do you recall making an appearance there? I don't recall it. How about I on LA in 1987? Do you recall that? 
Uh, I think the uh, the best way to respond to this is without the specific titles of the segments or, or a description of what they were, I'm not going to have an easy time recalling any of them because they didn't have all that much uh, uh, import to me. Well, just just for clarification, uh, uh, this curriculum vitae, that's a Latin word, correct? Those are Latin words. I think so. Uh, uh, an English word for this is a resume, right? I think that a resume and a curriculum vitae are probably different. Well, basically, though, this is supposed to be a compilation of all of your professional achievements, uh, your degrees, your writings, your lectures, your positions, your appointments, all of that, right? Uh, that's what a curriculum vitae normally does. Okay. And that's what this one purports to do, correct? Uh, as I said, I think it's out of date. Yes, but it still purports to at least give some of it, even if it's out of date. That's correct. And you don't know if you have a more recent one? I don't know. Will you look and bring it with you tomorrow when you return? I will look and see if I have a more recent one. Okay, fine. However, included on this document, this resume or CV, are television appearances, correct? That's correct. And these are appearances on which somehow involved your professional career. I mean, you were speaking about things, I assume, associated with sex therapy or psychology or both. That's correct. Okay. Uh, do you remember particularly an appearance on the John Davidson show in 1980 with a patient of yours? No, I was never on uh, John Davidson with a patient of mine. That's incorrect. Do you remember being on that show? Do you remember, by the way, having a videotape of that show at one point? Um, I might have somewhere. I don't know. And do you recall if that was a show, your appearance on that show had to do with phobias and how you had cured phobic behavior? Um, I don't think it said anything about me curing phobic behavior. I think the appearance was just one to discuss phobias, and it did not involve a patient of mine at all. So you were there to discuss phobias. You did do that show. I did discuss phobias. Did you do that show? On that show, yes. Okay. And you also were on the Today Show in 1978. Was that to discuss phobias or sex therapy or both? I have no recollection. Overall. I, I have no recollection of that at all. Did you seek out uh, television appearances? No, I did not. They sought you out. Is that correct? Uh, that would be correct. Now, I can explain that. I don't think it needs explaining. Thank you. Okay. On what, uh, in what year, and if you know more closely, uh, what date did you start a private practice? Uh, I think I started a private practice uh, the year that I was first licensed in the state of South Carolina, which would be, hmm, um, give me a moment here. I think 1972. Okay. And when did you start a private practice in California? I believe that would be 1974, approximately. And did you start in Beverly Hills, or did you get there later? No, I believe I began in Beverly Hills. Uh, just to go back for a moment, this 48 Hours show that you appeared on in 1990, did that have anything to do with this case? No, it had nothing to do with this case. Was it before the search warrant was served on you? Uh, the, <coughs> the show was filmed before the search warrant was, uh, was served on me. But it was shown afterwards? I don't recall. So you believe you started your practice in Beverly Hills in 1974? I believe so, approximately 1974. And at that time, did you also have some kind of affiliation with the University of Southern California Medical Center, County General? Yes, I did. And uh, did you, uh, were you teaching in some capacity or training in some capacity in sex therapy at County General? Uh, among many other areas, yes, I was also teaching and training in sex therapy, but only among other areas. And uh, 
at some point did your teaching at uh, USC end, or do you still do that? No, uh, up until several years ago, I was still um, on faculty at USC. Uh, oh. It did end only a couple of years ago. Um, I can explain uh, that I don't, process. Okay. Why don't you just wait for a question? It makes okay. it more organized. All right. In 1988, you've already indicated you first came in contact with the Menendez family. Is that right? I believe so. And, well, you don't, you're not sure? I haven't seen my records, as you know, Ms. Anderson, for approximately four years. I haven't had them. So I'm assuming that 1988 is, um, is about right. If you'd care to provide me with, my, uh, with the records, I'd, I probably could save some time. Well, are you, first let's establish the state of your memory. You, I, I honestly do not remember the year in which you first met the Menendez family. Is that what you're telling me? No, I believe it was 1988, um, but we've been talking about a lot of dates, and I'm, I was just thinking that it might save some time for me to have my own uh, patient record, sir. So you believe it was 1988, and do you recall which members of the Menendez family you came into contact with first? Uh, to the best of my recollection, or the answer would be, um, I believe so. You believe you do remember who? I believe I do. And who do you believe it was that you first came into contact with from this family? I believe that I first came into contact with uh, Kitty and Jose Menendez. And do you believe that it was after that that you first came into contact with Eric Menendez? I don't have a recollection uh, that's clear about whether I, con I talked with Eric later in that session or whether I contacted or talked with uh, Eric uh, after the first full session with uh, the Menendez's. Uh, Dr. Ozeal, you've uh, indicated in response to uh, questions from Mrs. Bozanich that on March 8th, the Beverly Hills Police went to the safe deposit box and removed some materials from it. Recall that? Yes, I do. And did they also remove some things from your home before going to the safe deposit box? Yes, they did. And among the things that were removed from your home, did they remove ledgers that uh, contained the account records of the Menendez family? Uh, yes, I believe they did. Your Honor, I would like to mark these documents, there are four pages of yellow accounting style papers. Uh, I propose to mark them uh, with one number in A, B, C, D, the pages. And that's fine. 97 A, B, C, and D. Let me just make sure they're in chronological order before I submark them. Of course not. Um. May I correct something or, or? Your Honor, there's no question pending. Is this a correction of an answer you've given to a question that's been asked? Uh, I, I believe it is, and, and maybe I can ask uh, the court whether, uh, whether it is or it isn't. It, it just relates to, she asked me about certifications. She didn't ask me about licensure. And, uh, Your Honor, there's no show. question pending. Somebody might ask that, so you can wait for them to ask questions. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let me just make sure I have these in, in order, Your Honor. They're written on both sides. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sir, showing you this uh, four-page document marked collectively 97, why don't you take a look at 97A for a moment and see if that reacquaints you with your acquaintance with the Menendez family. Uh, 
Yeah. Yes, but the uh, the first date doesn't have a uh, doesn't have any notation. Why don't you just look at it for a minute, and then I can ask you some questions. Okay. Now the first date uh, on that sheet is uh, September 30th, 1988. Is that correct? That's correct. And you don't recall now who you saw on that day. Well, I do recall that I saw Mr. and Mrs. Kitty and Jose Menendez. Um, I don't recall whether Eric was any part of, of that session or not. Okay. Now, why don't you look down from there? Is the next date October 4th, 1988? That's correct. And are there two entries for October 4th, 1988? Yes, there are. And is one of them for Mr. and Mrs. Menendez? That's correct. And is the other one for Eric? That's correct. And if you look down another line, do you see October 5th, 1988? I do. And does that indicate an entry for a session with Lyle Menendez? Yes, it does. Now, these ledger cards that I've put in front of you, 97A through D, contain only entries for uh, appointments with members of the Menendez family, no other patients. Is that correct? To the best of my knowledge. Well, if you have any doubt, why don't you look them over? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, as I peruse this, I only see entries for the Menendez uh, family, or Eric and uh, Lyle, and uh, and then the couple coming in for consultation. Well, we're talking about a, a nuclear family of four people, Mr., Mrs., Eric, and Lyle, correct? We're talking about a nuclear family, but I wasn't treating all four members of the family. I didn't ask you that, did I? All right. I ask you if those question. ledgers, those ledgers contain only appointment information for the four members of the Menendez nuclear family. And you said you weren't sure, so I let you look at it. So now, are you sure that's only the ledgers for the Menendez family contacts? Yes, that's that's all that I saw in perusing it. All right, the objection is overruled. Your next question, please. Now, in 1988 when you first met the Menendez family, did you tell any or all of them that your license was on probation at that time? I don't recall having told them that. And in 1989, in October, uh, specifically October 31st, when you had Eric and Lyle in your office, did you tell either of them at that time that your license was on probation? I don't believe I did. And it was still on probation, was it not, at the time that you uh, placed the tape, the notes, uh, the transcribed notes of which you've been using here, in the safe deposit box from whence the police retrieved it, correct? I believe so. In fact, it was on probation until 91, is that right? Um, best of my recollection. Now, I want to talk generally for a moment, sir, about uh, some of your practices in therapy. Foundational, your own. Overall. Thank you. When a patient comes to you and you have a psychotherapeutic session with them, ordinarily, do you write something about that session at some point? Um, for most sessions, yes, not for all sessions. Uh, it's a very individualized situation depending upon what's happening with the patient. Let's talk, though, just for the moment about your general practice. Particularly with a new <coughs> patient, would you make some effort following excuse me, a session to make some form of notes of what transpired? Uh, generally, yes, I would. And is there a formal, uh, well, is there a, a, a format, a formal psychotherapeutic note format that you follow ordinarily? No. Uh, are there something that are called, or that you would call, technical psychotherapeutic notes? No, I've never used that phrase. So, in 
so these notes are no different than what you jot down, uh, say, if you were on the phone with a friend and you wanted to remember a few things that they said? I don't believe I said that. Well, are they of some type of format or structure that you regularly <coughs> use? The format just has to do with um, with summarizing the the content of the session, uh, and it isn't a rigid structure or rigid format. and And the notes are highly variable; they depend very much on on the nature of the consultation and uh, how much new information is contained in it, so on and so forth. Why do you make notes? Uh, you make notes to have number one some record, but also I make notes uh, to have a uh, better ease with which to recall. Uh, what transpired in the session uh, subsequently. Well, you said first one reason was to make a record. What type of record? Just a record that the visit took place and, and for particularly important issues um, to make a record of what those issues were and what was discussed to be able to track what's happening in the, uh, in the course of the therapy. Okay, when you say issues, whose issues? Yours or the patient's or both? Ordinarily, the patient's issues. Okay, a patient comes to you, uh, as we've established, usually seeking help, seeking counseling. They have a problem, right? That's correct. And isn't it the duty and the, isn't it a necessity, in fact, in order to give therapy that the a therapist attempt to figure out what the problem is, or at least what the patient thinks the problem is? I think both of those would be an important uh, thing to do. And uh, is the purpose of note taking in this early stage so that you can uh, accurately record what issues or problems uh, the patient is presenting to you, this new person you've never seen before? That would be one purpose of note taking. Now, is another purpose of note taking, let me strike that, is it your practice in making patient notes to also indicate in notes some assessment? of the patient. I don't know what you mean by assessment. You'll have you to tell me. You don't know the terminology assessment? I don't know what you mean when you say assessment. Well, what does it mean in the psychological sense? It, it, the word assessment doesn't have any one meaning psychologically. It has multiple meanings. Well, let's talk about then some sort of evaluation on the therapist's part, uh, however tentative from a first meeting. Uh, do you tend to do that, make some sort of evaluation and make note of it? At some point, I uh, generally do have an evaluation and make a note of what the evaluation is, and that often uh, includes a diagnosis. So diagnosis is another thing that you do? Uh, that's correct. And do you also put in these notes some plan for therapy? Like, you've got this person, here's the problem as they see it, here's how you assess it or evaluate it or diagnose it, and then don't you write, now here's what I'm going to try to do. Generally, um, that's, that happens, yes. Now, this record that you're making, is this for your purpose or your benefit or is it for the patients or both? Um, well, it's, it really serves the patient's uh, benefit ultimately, and it's for my purpose in uh, assessing and working with the patient. Now, are these notes also in the way that you deal with them? Are you trying to make a record adequate so that if, for example, you should become ill or disabled or leave town or retire uh, or the patient leaves town, that these notes can be taken and given to a new therapist and that therapist can understand where the patient has been psychologically, what treatment they've been subjected to, how they've progressed, that sort of thing. Something that someone else can look over and get some meaning from. That would be one benefit or one purpose to making notes. And is, is there a legal component to making notes? Say a legal component, can you be more specific? Well, is there, uh, are, are notes in a sense of potentially a form of protection for therapists from civil liability, say, for such things as malpractice and wrongful death, things like that? They could be. And do you have that in mind when you write notes, potential civil liability? Not ordinarily, no. Sometimes? Rarely. But it happens. Once or twice.
And are notes also made so that you can remember what the patient told you last week so when they come in next week you don't misquote someone else's history to them or seem ignorant or uninterested or uncaring or unconcerned by not remembering what they've told you. Sure, that would be a reason for making notes as well. Now I'd like to show you before I do that, let me ask you if in 1988 it was your standard practice to um, maintain <coughs> notes of sessions with your patients as a general practice. I believe that it was. Was the same true in 1989? I believe that it was. And was the same true in 1990? I believe that it was. Now, when you started your private practice in Beverly Hills in 1974, uh, did you have office hours and see patients five days a week or something less than that? Something less than that. Have you ever had a five-day-a-week practice in the sense that you saw private patients at your office five days a week? I believe so. And was that true in 1988, 89, and 90? Uh, I don't recall. Like I said, I haven't seen uh, those records for, many, for numerous years. Do you have a private clinical practice now? Yes, I do. Do you see patients now? Yes, I do. And do you see patients five days a week? No, I do not. How many days a week do you see patients now? Oh, approximately two and a half days a week. And uh, was that true as well in last year, in 1992? I don't recall. Uh, you, do you recall 91? No, I don't. Okay. Let me, uh, if I might, approach your honor. Now, these are. Can I ask counsel to approach the sun park for a moment? Your honor, I have two uh, appointment style books. I'd like to mark the one that's marked 1989, exhibit 98. And the one that's marked week at a glance and inside says 1990, exhibit 99. Now, Dr. Azeel, here's what I propose to do. First of all, I just want you to identify these as your appointment books for the years uh, 1989 and 1990. And if you just glance through them to assure yourself that that's what they are, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to look at them a little more carefully. That's what they look like they are. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. uh, what I'd ask you to do, first of all, um, those books appear to have the names of patients in them. And you understand that I'm not going to be eliciting from you the names of any of those patients in that book. You do understand that, correct? I do. All right. What I would ask you to do, though, in order for um, me to continue with questions about the nature of your practice, is for you to look at the 89 book, uh, first of all, with, in order to allow you to answer my question concerning how many w days a week uh, did you see patients in your clinical practice. So take whatever time you need to uh, re-familiarize yourself with that book. Okay. All right, are you able now to answer the question as to how many days a week uh, were you seeing patients in your practice in 1989? It appears to be three days. And now if you would uh, switch over to the 1990 book, which I believe only contains three months of entries, actually less than that. That's correct. And just see, for the months of January, February, and for the early part of March, whether your frequency of seeing patients remained the same or changed. Um, it appears to have 
it's approximately the same, so far as I can tell. I believe what the 1989 book shows is that you saw patients on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Is that right? Um, that's what it appears to be for the bulk of the book. And in 1990, for the months of January, February, and that little bit of March that's there before the police sees the head. Excuse me, I need to make a correction. I'm, I'm seeing that there are, there are weeks here where, I'm, uh, where there are definitely four days worth of patients. So, uh, I mean, it, it isn't always the case that I saw people three days a week. I'm okay, looking at it. You're talking about when you say here, which book are you looking at, 89 or 90? No, I'm looking at 1989. Okay, now look at 1990. Okay, 1990. There are some days, let me see if I understand what you just said. There are some days in 1989 when you would see one or two patients on a, on a fourth day or you'd have some phone therapy with someone on a fourth day. Is that right? Um, uh, it looks like I definitely am seeing people four days a week in 1990. In 1990? Yes. Yes, you're seeing people in 1990, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday afternoons and Friday. Is that what it looks like? That's what it appears to be for the first three months. Mm -hmm. uh, but in 89, Thursday, uh, the Thursday afternoon was not a regular five to seven patient booking as it is in 1990, isn't that true? Uh, it looks to be more ir irregular in 1989. Correct? There are some days that it's, it's more booked and some days it's not. Now, we've heard, or uh, I suppose I've heard, and perhaps you've heard, about what's called the 50-minute hour. Do you know what that refers to with respect to psychiatrists? I've heard that phrase used. Okay, and, and what does that refer to, the 50-minute hour? Well, that uh, classically, um, a lot of psychotherapists see patients for 50 minutes, and sometimes it's for more than 50 minutes, sometimes it's for less than 50 minutes, but that psychiatrists and or psychologists or psychotherapists generally don't see people for a full 60 minutes. So the 50-minute hour, does that mean that if you book an hour of a psychiatrist or psychologist time, you get 50 minutes with him and then he gets 10 minutes to do whatever, but you're basically paying for that hour? That, isn't that what the 50-minute hour means? I th I'd be speculating about what the 50-minute hour means. I, if you want me to speculate, yes, I think that's what it means. Okay, well, don't speculate if you don't know what it means. It's okay to say, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't use that term, so I don't know what other people mean by it. You don't use that term because it's true, is it not, Dr. Ozeal, that you bill for 45-minute sessions? That's correct. And in 1989 and 1990, you billed $150 for each 45-minute session. Is that correct? Probably correct. That would you be... don't know? No, that would have been my... I think that would have been my, uh, my billing rate. Well, has it gone up? Uh, yes, but I think that that was the billing rate in that, at that period of time. So at this time, you charge more than $150 for 45 minutes. Is that right? Right. But in 1989 and 1990, if you have any doubt, you have the ledger sheets in front of mm -hmm. you. I, I believe that that's true. That, uh, uh, I've just picked a random day, and, and, uh, and if it doesn't inform you enough, you can turn to any other day you want. But it does appear that... Uh, most of the appointments are set at 45-minute intervals, does it not? That's what it appears to, to be, yeah. And um, some patients apparently uh, have like a double session, an hour and a half continuously, and then a new patient shows up, correct? That occurs sometimes, yes. And the new patient can be with you for 45 minutes, and then another patient shows up. Correct? That sometimes happens. All right. Now, this is your appointment book, um, which I believe is not in your handwriting. Is that correct? That's correct. You had an employee of some sort who did the writing in these books. That's correct. None of my writing is in the books. But I, I would like you to uh, search your memory to see if what is displayed on those days, the booking of people 45 minutes apart, is in fact what you were experiencing in your office. Every 45 minutes, somebody else showed up. Well, that wouldn't be accurate. Sometimes um, there, were, there were long gaps between seeing people. Sometimes I took a half an hour break. Uh, it's true that I saw people for 45 minute sessions, but it definitely isn't true that I saw people uh, you know, 45 minutes, uh, each 45 minutes a new person came in. That would be an inaccurate statement. Well, let's go back to the book. I think I just showed you a day when that at least recorded the day would be true. They booked 45 minutes apart. So sometimes there's a break somewhere in the day, but 
Some days, people are just booked one right after another, 45 minutes apart, particularly the well, morning session. I should mention, uh, as clarification, that I don't always see people for 45 minutes. Some people I see for half hours. Uh, the, the, there are not, uh, they're not all 45-minute sessions. So the fact that people are booked into 45-minute uh, time periods does not mean that I saw each one of these people for 45 minutes. It could mean that I saw them for for 20 minutes or for a half hour or for um, anything, or for that matter, an hour and a half. Uh, ordinarily, however, Dr. Azeel, in looking through those books, I've noticed, and perhaps you will notice if you will look through them, that when Let's someone... Let's ask the question. Sorry. Uh, isn't it true that if someone's there for less than a full session, it's marked on that book as half of a session or half an hour, but when it's just the name, it indicates a 45-minute regular session. Yeah, I don't know. Meaning, I don't know because I didn't. Uh, I didn't <laughs> keep this appointment book. Um, and as a matter of fact, this appointment book was not used by me for uh, clinical purposes at all. This appointment book was actually kept in my office, and um, until uh, this was seized. I don't know that I even saw this. This was an office copy uh, for office purposes of keeping track of who is coming in. Uh, and so I would have no idea whether this corresponded to how long I actually saw somebody or, or even um, the accuracy of it, except insofar as I would certainly hope that it was accurate. Wasn't that the book from which the billings were uh, compiled? I also don't know that. I mean, you don't uh, know. You don't know what was used to bill people a hundred and fifty dollars for every forty-five minutes. You don't know what was used to do that. I think I said I don't know if this was the book that was used. Okay, but uh, what I'm asking you is, for, I'm looking on the face of, and you can point to any page that you think uh, disputes what I'm saying. But in looking on the face of those pages, it appears that appointments are booked with named patients at 45-minute intervals. It does appear that way in this book. And weren't those books seized pursuant to search warrant from your home? Yes, they were. And that's where they were kept all the time, in your home? In a business office within my home, yes. To which you were permitted entry? That's correct. In fact, it was your office. <coughs> no, it wasn't my office. It was a business office. A whose business? Well, it was the professional practice, but um, it wasn't my office in the sense that I used it on a daily basis to be using it as an office. It's in your house, and it's the office of your professional practice. Is that what you mean? Right. It's your practice, so it's your office, right? Okay. That's the sense in which you mean it. And wasn't it, in fact, an appointment book, if not that particular one, one maintained in a similar way that is used to send bills to these people. And uh, I don't know whether this appointment book was used to send bills to people or not. Well, do you know what kind of appointment book was used to send bills to people? Frankly, I'm not sure. And who did the billing? Um, the secretaries that were employed at the time, and in addition to that, um, my wife uh, sometimes acts as sort of an overall office manager. So do you think your wife would know I, which book was used for the billing? She might. Who was the secretary that you had who did the billing in 1989? I don't, uh, I don't recall. I'm not sure. Well, who, among, who are the choices? Um, I think that there, I think that actually, I'm not sure. I'm not sure which, it, which person it was. And I don't know who's writing this is. <laughs> but I think my wife would know. I can ask her. So why don't we see among, do you know somebody named Sandy? Yes. Was she your secretary for a long time? Uh, yes, she was. Uh -huh. Did she do billing? Um, she did. Did she work for you in 1989? I don't recall if she did or didn't. I don't know when she stopped Does working. she work for you now? She does not. What's her full name? Her name is um, Sandy Lambeck. L-A-M-B-E-C-K? Mm, yes. And do you know who was your secretary after Sandy? No, I do not. Do you know who your secretary is now? Um, actually, I'm, I think her name is Dolores. And does Dolores come to your home where your office is? Um, she, it, the, the home is in, I mean, the office is in an adjoining room to the home, and yes, she does. Uh, did Sandy Lambeck work for you in uh, 
September of 1990? Um, she may have. She probably did. Well, I thought you just told us she didn't work for you in 1989. Well, you just refreshed my memory. We've had a, uh, a number of different secretaries. I refreshed your memory because I'm holding a document that you may think may contradict you. Is that what you're saying? No, I didn't even know you were holding a document. Did you hold a press conference in September of 1990 at which you submitted a document signed by Sandy Lembeck? Um, I believe I did. And uh, did this document signed by Sandy Lem Lembeck refer to things that had occurred uh, with respect to a woman named Judelon Rose Smith? Um, yes, it did. And was Judelon Rose Smith someone that you met? in 1989? Um, yes, she was. And in this document was Sandy Lembeck uh, asserting that she worked for you and had personal knowledge of uh, certain matters that transpired between you and Judelon Smith in 1989? Um, I believe so. I haven't seen that for a couple of years either. So. And if that were true, would that indicate to you that Sandy Lembeck was your secretary in 1989? Would it yes. not? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Uh, yes, that looks familiar. And does that appear to be the signature or a copy of the signature of your secretary, Sandy Lembeck? Appears to be. And uh, does that appear to be a document signed in September of 1990? It appears to be. And is it referring, in fact, to things that transpired in 1989? I don't recall what, when some of these things transpired, but I believe they probably uh, would have been in 1989. And in, by this document, uh, Ms. Lembeck is basically saying she's your secretary. Objection sustained. At that same press conference on September 13, 1990, didn't you, in fact, tell the media that you had in your possession a declaration from your secretary? I don't recall, but if you have something stating I did, I probably did. Now let's get back to the appointment books. Okay. <coughs> Do you believe that you were making notes in 1989 uh, I, of patient sessions? I believe I was. And what was your standard practice for making notes? When would you do it? In what form would you do it? And then what would you do with them? Okay. I would uh, make notes, usually after sessions. Sometimes um, I make notes in um, groupings, meaning I'll summarize. Well, oh. I, I just did, for one thing, the mic pops if you oh. get too close. Okay. You said you would make notes after sessions, sometimes in groupings? Groupings, meaning I would summarize um, what what's transpired over the past month with a given patient, something of that nature. And um, that would be my practice. Okay. Let's start with uh, the first thing. You said you would make notes after the sessions. Does that mean that after every 45-minute session, before the next patient shows up, you'd write something down? No, not always. Uh, very often at the end of the day, I would make notes um, summarizing uh, what had happened with the people that I saw that day, most particularly with people whose, um, whose issues warranted more exploration, more note-taking. All right. Well, let, let's see if I understand now. You, let's say a patient comes in at 8 o'clock in the morning. You do have some appointments even that early in 1989, do you not? I don't know. I'd have to look to see, but it, it appears that uh, most days I don't have people that early. Well, if you want, I can show you, but uh, let's say 9 o'clock then. Okay. okay? Someone comes in at 9 o'clock, they have issues <clears throat> that are worth writing about. You don't write anything while the people are there. Is that right? That's correct. This is well, not no, that wouldn't be correct. I sometimes write things while they're there. Um, I just don't generally take all the notes of a session while the person is in session with me. Well, I want to find out about your general practice. Generally, is it your practice when your patients are there with you that you're making any kind of notes in their presence? Um, it's not possible to generalize like that. With some people I do and some people I don't. It depends on, very much on what's happening and, and uh, what the nature of the problem is. Okay, so you're now testifying that there are patients 
with whom you actually write things down during the course of sessions. Are we clear that you are saying that? That's correct. And are there other patients where you don't ever write anything down during the course of the session? Um, there probably are. Well, do you know or are you guessing? Well, I think that there are. I think I can recall some people where I don't write things down during the course of the session. And with the people where you, uh, well, either one I think you've indicated that you would do more writing, whether you took some notes down during the session or not, you would do more writing after the session. Usually. Well, isn't that how you st answered uh, four questions back? When I asked you about your general practice, you say you make notes after sessions, sometimes in groupings to summarize the past month. Didn't you say that? I think I did, yes. Yes, and you didn't say, I make notes during the sessions and after. You just said after, right? Well, I think I corrected it. All right, so now we're corrected that you make notes during and do you always add to those notes after? No, sometimes I don't add to the notes at all. So, you, so with some patients, you make complete notes during the session? I make as, m as many notes as I feel are necessary for that session during the session sometimes. And is that the majority of your patients? I, I don't know how to, I think I'd be completely uh, speculating and, and uh, guessing about that. I don't know if it's a majority or not a majority. W was this a standard practice with respect to certain patients? For example, you know, I'll make up names, okay? John Doe, let's assume you have a patient named John Doe. Uh, would you decide based on, you know, whatever John Doe's problem is or how you relate to John Doe or what John Doe's therapy is all about, that John Doe is a patient whose notes you choose to make during the session? No, it really didn't work like that and doesn't work like that. Well, would it be periodic then? With some patients, sometimes you'd make notes during the sessions, but with those same patients, other times you'd only make notes after. That would probably be uh, the way that it happened more often. Okay. So the way that it happened more often would be that you're just, you don't have a general pattern patient by patient. Is that what you're saying? Uh, that's... Uh, I would say that with some frequency, I take notes during sessions, and most particularly take notes when something uh, critical is happening as a way of memorializing um, an insight or, or uh, a uh, particular issue that I want to make sure that I get down. And if nothing uh, that critical is happening or if, um, if the notes would have to be very elaborate, usually I do those notes um, after the sessions. Do you think your sessions with Eric and Lyle Menendez on October 31st were critical? Yes, I do. How about the session on November 2nd? Was that critical? Yes, it was. You didn't make any notes whatsoever during those sessions. Isn't that true? I certainly did not. Now, on days that would be uh, very busy, where you'd see a lot of patients, I take it that most of your non-intra session notes would be made at the end of the day. Is that right? Or the next day, or the day after that? Is usually. That Is that usually true? Usually. And I take it when we're talking about notes generally in your practice, we're talking about something you write, correct? Usually. And did you use a word processor or a computer or did you do your notes in handwriting? No, usually did my notes in handwriting. <coughs> and in what form, would, I mean, were these notes on a particular form or a particular kind of paper or in a particular book? No, actually, um, the notes would be just jotted down on a kind of paper, lined paper, whatever, um, but they're not in a particular kind of form or book. Now, did you see members of the Menendez family periodically over much of the course of the period between September 30th, 1988, and August 20th, 1989. I would say that would be a true statement. But uh, members of the family would imply that I saw Mr. and Mrs. or Jose and Kitty Menendez uh, with some frequency, which I did not. I don't remember saying anything about frequency. I said periodically. Now, is the statement still true? 
periodically. Yes. Yes. And on um, a date close in proximity to and after August 20th, 1989, did you <laughs> learn of the killings of Jose and Kitty Menendez? Um, I believe I did. And did you make contact with one or both of the Menendez children after hearing that? Uh, yes, I did. And did you go to where they were staying with their family um, and visit with them? I wouldn't characterize it that way. Well, did you go to where they were? Um, I had sessions with them where they were. Your Honor, I'd move to strike the answer. It is not responsive. If I'm wrong, say no. All right. Uh, you addressing that to me? If no, you're wrong, sir. say no. No, you, <laughs> you say. When you feel no, you do worse than say no. I'm okay. talking to the witness. I, I realize I should have asked the court to do that. All right. Well, let's um, uh, re-ask the question then. The objection is sustained. The answer is stricken. Why don't you okay. ask the question again? Let's break it into pieces. Did you reach out and contact them, either Eric or Lyle or both? Yes, I did. And at some point, did you go to the place where they were staying? Are you referring to the Bel Air Hotel? Yes, I am. Yes, I did. And when you went to the Bel Air Hotel, were members of their family there with them? There were members of their family in addition to a number of other people that were there with but them. But the question was, were there members of family? Yes, there okay. were. And do you recall what was the first date upon which you went to the Bel Air Hotel and saw the Menendez brothers and other people? No, I do not. Do you have the ledger card there? I do have the ledger cards here. Why don't you look at it for dates after August 20th, 1989, okay. and see if that will refresh your memory as to when you went to the Bel Air Hotel. Okay, I see um, August 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Now, um, I asked, the question is, do you recall the first date upon which you went to the Bel Air Hotel and saw Eric and Lyle and these other people? It appears to be August 23rd. Okay. I don't recall it. It appears to be. And uh, did you go back on the 24th? Um, yes, it appears that I did. And uh, what about the 25th? I wouldn't know whether the 25th was, a, um, was at the Bel Air Hotel or whether it was in my office. I don't, I don't know that. Um, you said, does this tell you when you went to the Bel Air Hotel? All the ledger card tells me is that I saw them for sessions that I would assume must have been at the Bel Air Hotel because of how many sessions they were billed for, but I don't know that these sessions were at the Bel Air Hotel. So you were having private therapy sessions with them at the Bel Air Hotel? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying I was consulting with them at their request at the Bel Air Hotel um, and basically doing what I thought was therapeutic with them. That's correct. Okay. Well, l let's break that down. Mm -hmm. Are these private therapeutic sessions or are they just public visiting? Which is it? No, I was specifically uh, requested. No, it's not responsive. Let's okay. start over. Is this private therapeutic session so that you are speaking to one or both of them in confidentiality? That's the first question. Uh, the answer is no, they were not private therapeutic sessions. Okay, so they're not. No, they're, they were not. But you bill them for them at the same rate that you charge for private therapeutic sessions, uh, $150 for every 45 minutes. Is that right? That's my custom. But that's what you did here? Yes, it is. And in fact, on August 24th, you billed them $1,300. Is that, that correct? That's correct. That reflects the time I spent with them. And this is after you called with your condolences. Is that right? No, that's not right. You didn't call with your condolences? No, I did not. You didn't feel badly? I didn't say that. Ms. Abramson, you know that. 
What I know, Dr. Ozil, is not Counsel, let's not argue with the witness. Did you call uh, with your, your condolences question. or mm. express your feelings of sentiment, support to them? I'm sure that in the first couple of minutes or a minute of interaction, I did, and I'm, I'm also uh, sure in my memory that what I did immediately thereafter was ask them if, in fact, uh, ask Eric, as I recall, if, in fact, um, he wanted me uh, to uh, be there as a person, as a therapist, to help him. And the response that I got was, yes, he did. And um, the, the next question was, did he want to come into my office? Your Honor, I think now we're completely non-responsive to the last question. Objection overruled. Why don't you finish the answer? Okay. Um, I asked if he wanted to come to my office, and he said, no, he couldn't come to my office, and neither could Lyle, because they were fearful of their lives that the mafia Your Honor, was... I'd move to strike this as totally non-responsive. All right, the objection is overruled. The answer will stand up to the point uh, where uh, the reference is as to the fact that uh, Eric Menendez, or to the testimony of the witness that Eric said that he couldn't go to the office as to why uh, that is stricken as non-responsive. Let me ask your next question. Who did write this ledger card? It probably was the secretary. It definitely the, wasn't me. The secretary or your secretary? Oh, it would have been my secretary. All right, your secretary. And your secretary uses the word session. Does she have your authorization and instruction to use that word? Uh, no, I don't necessarily know that she had any authorization or instruction to use any particular word. I probably just told her the total amount of uh, time that I spent with uh, Eric and um, Lyle, and she probably just broke Your it down Honor, into I billing to segments. I strike this as speculation and not responsive. All right, the objection is sustained. Um, if you can answer a question yes or no, it would help, uh, rather than going into an explanation which can be done by counsel and asking a follow-up question if they choose to do that. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> now, sir, a session in your practice is a block of time 45 minutes long, correct? Uh, that's correct. And you bill, do you not, $150 per session, correct? At that time, that was correct. And so when your secretary notes on the ledger sessions, that's a unit of billing, correct? That's how she broke that down. That's correct. And for August 24th, the units, there were eight <coughs> units or sessions plus half an hour, correct? It looks like that's what it says. And the amount of money, does that seem consistent with eight 45-minute sessions plus half an hour? Approximately. Now, on 8.23, the ledger shows three sessions and it says consult. Now, does, does that lead you to believe that this is other than sessions in your office? I have no idea why this person wrote down consult or sessions. I really don't. <coughs> Let's take a look at 826. Is there an entry for that date? Yes, there is. And that says four sessions, correct? That's correct. Was there a memorial service for Mr. and Mrs. Menendez here in Los Angeles? Um, Yes, there was. Do you know what day it was on? Um, I don't know what day it was on. Did you attend? Yes, I did. Did you bill for it? If that's the day that it was, uh, that it was held, yes, I did. Well, I don't know if that's the date it was held, but did you instruct your secretary to bill for your attendance at the memorial service? I don't think that the, the four sessions were at the memorial service at all. I think they were. I, I don't no. think that's what I asked. No, I didn't. I'm asking you this. Do you recall instructing your secretary or bookkeeper or whoever makes these things to bill for the time you spent attending the memorial service? No, I did not. If I read this correctly, however, you were in the presence of the Menendez family on the 23rd, the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th. Is 
Is that right? That's correct. Why don't you open the appointment book, Dr. Ozeal, for 1989 and turn to uh, August 23rd? May I approach him? Yes. Yes, both counsel. August 29th. No, August 23rd. Oh, 23rd, okay. Mm. Okay, do you see an entry in the appointment book uh, for Menendez three sessions for August 23rd? That's correct. Now that matches, does it not, the ledger entry of three sessions on August 23rd? Yes, it does. Now let's go to August 24th. Mm hmm. Do yes. You see an entry for Menendez that says eight sessions. Yes, I do. And that matches the uh, ledger card, correct? Yes, it does. Let's look at August 25th. Do you see an entry there for Menendez that also matches the ledger card? Yes, I do. And August 26th, do you see another entry that also matches the ledger card? Yes, I do. So the appointment book and the ledger cards do seem to. Uh, Corroborate each other. Is that right? In this regard, yes, they do. In June of nineteen eighty nine, did you become acquainted with a woman named Judalon Smith? Um, yes, I did. And on October 31st, 1989, did you see Judalon Smith? Uh, yes, I did. And as of October 31st, 1989, were you having a relationship with Judalon Smith which had a sexual component? Yes, I was. And at some point on October 31st, 1989, did you tell Judalon Smith what Eric and Lyle Menendez had said to you in their therapy session with you on that day? Um, no, I didn't tell her the totality of what they had said. I told her what I felt that I needed to disclose. Did you tell her anything of what they said? Yes, I did. Did you tell them? that you were going to tell Judalon Rose Smith, who you met in June of 1989, anything of what they were telling you? No, I did not. Now, did you make these revelations to Ms. Smith in your office or somewhere else? I believe I uh, told Judalon Smith um, what I felt that I needed to tell her um, it at her home. Dr. Ozeal, was there some reason why you inserted in that answer what I needed to tell, tell her when I asked you a location? Some reason you felt you needed to do that? I was explaining what occurred. All right. I asked you where. Can you answer where? Excuse me, I'm just sorry. All right, he has answered the question. Now, you believe it was at her home. Do you have some doubt in your mind about where it was? To the best of my recollection, it was at her home. Are you sure it was at her home? I'm relatively certain it was at her home. Are you absolutely positive it was at her home? I believe I said I'm relatively certain it was no, at her home. No, then the answer is no. You're not absolutely positive. I'm basically as positive as I can be that it was at her home. So you are positive it was at her home. That's an argument about it. Sustained. Now, you're aware of the fact that she claims that she was in your office while the Menendez brothers were seeing you on October 31st, are you not? Yeah, I'm aware. Mm -hmm. It's not Objection. offered for the truth? Still objection sustained, the answer is stricken. Did you ask Judalon Smith to come to your office on October 31st in order to eavesdrop on your therapy sessions with the Menendez brothers that day? Actually, it was quite the contrary. 
Right. Well, did you, can you answer that question, yes or no, Dr. Ozil? I don't think I can. You I mean, can't answer that. You did. Did you ask you him it? to be there? No, I didn't. There you go. Yes, if you could confine yourself to questions and listening to the witnesses' answers, Ms. Abramson. So you didn't ask her to be there, correct? That's correct. And is it your testimony that she was not there? I do not recall Judalon Smith being there that I saw her. I was in session with uh, Eric and Lyle uh, for approximately four to four and a half hours, and um, I would have no way of knowing whether anybody else uh, came into my uh, waiting room while I was in session with somebody. So the answer is, to the best of my knowledge, no, she was not there. Well, if you have no way of knowing, then your answer, I take it, is you don't know. I don't know, but I do not believe she was there. Can people just walk into your office at any hour of the day or night, the door's unlocked, is that right? Absolutely, the door to the waiting room is unlocked. They can't walk into the inner corridor that leads to session rooms, but they can walk into the waiting room. At all hours of the day or night? Well, I wouldn't say that. I would say as long as there is any therapist remaining in the office seeing patients, the uh, waiting room door is closed, but the, uh, the door to the waiting room is from the outside is uh, unlocked. After you finished seeing Eric and Lyle on October 31st, did you see Judalon Smith in your office? I don't recall having seen Judalon Smith in my office. Well, do you think you would recall if she had been there? Um, I don't have any recollection of her being there. Did you make some phone calls after you saw Eric and Lyle on October 31st? Yes, I did. Did you make those calls from your office? Yes, I did. Was Judalon Smith present when you made those phone calls? I do not recall Judalon Smith being there then either. Was she there? I don't recall her being there. So are you saying she wasn't there or are you just saying you don't remember? I don't believe she was there. Well, you don't believe she was there? I, don't, I don't recall Judalon Smith as having been there, no. Was it raining that night? I have no idea whether it was raining or not. Were you wearing clothes that night? Uh, yes, I was wearing clothes. You're certain of that? I am certain I was wearing clothes. That's okay. correct to Ms. Abramson. It's not that you believe you were wearing clothes. You know you were wearing clothes. Is that correct? I do know I was wearing clothes. That's correct, Ms. Abramson. Do you know if Judalon Smith was there or not? Overruled. I don't believe Judalon Smith was in my office. I don't recall having seen her. Do you know if she was there? I can't know if she walked into the waiting room, no. Did she walk into your office, into your field of vision, when you were making the phone calls? No. Who did you call? Um, I called several attorneys. Who? Um, I don't remember all the names of the attorneys that I called. Who do you remember? One of the people that I called was uh, Mr. Brunon. And you called him from your office phone? Yes, I did. And what was the number of that phone? What was the number of Mr. Brunon's phone? Yours. My phone. Um, 310-278-6342. 278-6342. That's correct. And uh, did you reach Mr. Brunon? I don't recall. I actually uh, talked to a number of people over several days, and I don't know who I called or didn't call. Let's back up. We're just on October 31st, right after Eric and Lyle have left, correct? Correct. You've made a series of calls, right? Right. Now, you said you called a number of attorneys. You've remembered for us one of them, your attorney, Mr. Brunon, who currently represents you, correct? Correct. Do you remember talking to Mr. Brunon from your office October 31st after Eric and Lyle left? I don't recall which specific people I talked to that night. I was uh, in a state of... Um, Excuse me, Your Honor, but could the witness be instructed to try to answer the question? Save right. a lot of time. All right. Without um, comments by counsel, as I said, if you could answer yes or no, it would help us all. Thank you. Do yes, you question again. Yeah. Sorry, Your Honor. Do you remember talking to Mr. Brune on that night? N no, I don't, specifically. Now. Who else did you call that night, not over several days, right there from your office? Who else did you call? 
I believe I called um, a uh, another therapist. All right. Who who was that? That would be uh, Dr. Lulo. Dr. Who? Lulo. How do you spell that? L U L O W. And where is Dr. Lulo located? He's located in Beverly Hills. And is he still in Beverly Hills? I believe he is. And did you reach Dr. Lulo? I recall having reached him. So you talked to him? I believe so. Was there any other psychologist, therapist, person involved with the certifying or licensing of psychologists that you spoke to that night? No, absolutely not. And did you speak to your own therapist that night? No, I did not. Did you speak to anyone that night with whom you had a privileged relationship where you were the holder of the privilege? Um, if I spoke with Mr. Brunon, which I'm not sure. I don't mean yeah. your lawyer. I mean in a psychotherapeutic sense, that um, privilege. Not that I'm aware. Are you aware of the fact that you attempted to assert such a privilege in testimony before Judge Albrecht in the summer of 1990 when we were questioning you about who you called? Can I have a please? Yes. All right, we're going to take a break at this point until tomorrow morning.